Section 81 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The World's Story, Volume 12. The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 81. When Washington Took Command, 1775, by Henry Cabot Lodge without any serious opposition in the name of the united colonies the congress adopted the army of new england men besieging boston as the continental army and proceeded to appoint a commander-in-chief to direct its operations practically this was the most important step taken in the whole course of the war of independence nothing less than the whole issue of the struggle for ultimate defeat or for ultimate victory turned upon the selection to be made at this crisis the choice of washington for commander-in-chief was suggested and strongly urged by john adams and when on the fifteenth of june the nomination was formally made by thomas johnson of maryland it was unanimously confirmed then washington rising said with great earnestness since the congress desire i will enter upon the momentous duty and exert every power i possess in their service and for the support of the glorious cause but i beg it may be remembered by every gentleman in the room that i this day declare with the utmost sincerity i do not think myself equal to the command i am honored with he refused to take any pay for his services but said he would keep an accurate account of his personal expenses which congress might reimburse should it see fit after the close of the war john fisk accompanied by lee and schuyler and with a brilliant escort he had ridden but twenty miles when he was met by the news of bunker hill did the militia fight was the immediate and characteristic question and being told that they did fight he exclaimed then the liberties of the country are safe given the fighting spirit washington felt he could do anything full of this important intelligence he pressed forward to newark where he was received by a committee of the provincial congress sent to conduct the commander-in-chief to new york there he tarried long enough to appoint schuyler to the charge of the military affairs in that colony having mastered on the journey its complicated social and political conditions pushing on through connecticut he reached watertown where he was received by the provincial congress of massachusetts on july second with every expression of attachment and confidence lingering less than an hour for this ceremony he rode on to the headquarters at cambridge and when he came within the lines the shouts of the soldiers and the booming of cannon announced his arrival to the english in boston the next day he rode forth in the presence of a great multitude and the troops having been drawn up before him he drew his sword beneath the historical elm tree and took command of the first american army his excellency wrote dr thatcher in his journal was on horseback in company with several military gentlemen it was not difficult to distinguish him from all others he is tall and well proportioned and his personal appearance truly noble and majestic he is tall and of easy and agreeable address the loyalist kerwin had remarked a few weeks before while mrs john adams warm-hearted and clever wrote to her husband after the general's arrival dignity ease and complacency the gentleman and the soldier look agreeably blended in him modesty marks every line and feature of his face those lines of dryden instantly occurred to me mark his majestic fabric he's a temple sacred by birth and built by hands divine his soul's the deity that lodges there nor is the pile unworthy of the god lady lawyer and surgeon patriot and tory all speak alike and as they wrote so new england felt a slave owner an aristocrat and a churchman washington came to cambridge to pass over the heads of native generals to the command of a new england army among a democratic people hard-working and simple in their lives and dissenters to the backbone who regarded episcopacy as something little short of papistry and quite equivalent to toryism yet the shout that went up from soldiers and people in cambridge common on that pleasant july morning 
came from the heart and had no jarring note a few of the political chiefs growled a little in later days at washington but the soldiers and the people high and low rich and poor gave him an unstinted loyalty on the fields of battle and throughout eight years of political strife the men of new england stood by the great virginian with a devotion and truth in which was no shadow of turning here again we see exhibited most conspicuously the powerful personality of the man who was able thus to command immediately the allegiance of this naturally cold and reserved people what was it that they saw that inspired them at once with so much confidence they looked upon a tall handsome man dressed in plain uniform wearing across his breast a broad blue band of silk which some may have noticed as the badge and symbol of a certain solemn league and covenant once very momentous in the english-speaking world they saw his calm high bearing and in every line of face and figure they beheld the signs of force and courage yet there must have been something more to call forth the confidence then so quickly given and which no one ever long withheld all felt dimly but none the less surely that here was a strong able man capable of rising to the emergency whatever it might be capable of continued growth and development clear of head and warm of heart and so the new england people gave to him instinctively their sympathy and their faith and never took them back the shouts and cheers died away and then washington returned to his temporary quarters in the wadsworth house to master the task before him the first great test of his courage and ability had come and he faced it quietly as the excitement caused by his arrival passed by he saw before him to use his own words a mixed multitude of people under very little discipline order or government in the language of one of his aides the entire army if it deserved the name was but an assemblage of brave enthusiastic undisciplined country lads the officers in general quite as ignorant of military life as the troops excepting a few elderly men who had seen some irregular service among the provincials under lord amherst with this force ill posted and very insecurely fortified washington was to drive the british from boston his first step was to count his men and it took eight days to get the necessary returns which in an ordinary army would have been furnished in an hour when he had them he found that instead of twenty thousand as had been represented but fourteen thousand soldiers were actually present for duty in a short time however mr emerson the chaplain noted in his diary that it was surprising how much had been done and that the lines had been so extended and the work so shrewdly built that it was morally impossible for the enemy to get out except in one place purposefully left open a little later the same observer remarked there is a great overturning in the camp as to order and regularity new lords new laws the generals washington and lee are upon the lines every day the strictest government is taking place and great distinction is made between officers and soldiers bodies of troops scattered here and there by chance were replaced by well distributed forces posted wisely and effectively in strong entrenchments it is little wonder that the worthy chaplain was impressed and now seeing it all from every side we too can watch order come out of chaos and mark the growth of an army under the guidance of a master mind and the steady pressure of an unbending will then too there was no discipline for the army was composed of raw militia who elected their officers and carried on war as they pleased in a passage suppressed by mr sparks washington said there is no such thing as getting officers of this stamp to carry orders into execution to curry favor with the men by whom they were chosen and on whose smile they may possibly think that they may again rely seems to be one of the principal objects of their attention i have made a pretty good slam amongst such kind of officers as the massachusetts government abounds in since i came into this camp having broke one colonel and two captains for cowardly behavior in the action on bunker hill two captains for drawing more pay and provisions than they had men in their company and one for being absent from his post when the enemy appeared there 
and burnt a house just by it besides these i have at this time one colonel one major one captain and two subalterns under arrest for trial in short i spare none and yet fear it will not all do as these people seem to be too attentive to everything but their own interests this may be plain and homely in phrase but it is not stilted and the quick energy of the word shows how the new england farmers and fishermen were being rapidly brought to discipline bringing the army into order however was but a small part of his duties it is necessary to run over all his difficulties great and small at this time and count them up in order to gain a just idea of the force and capacity of the man who overcame them washington moreover was obliged to deal not only with his army but with the general congress and the congress of the province he had to teach them utterly ignorant as they were of the needs and details of war how to organize and supply their armies there was no commissary department there were no uniforms no arrangements for ammunition no small arms no cannon no resources to draw upon for all these necessities of war little by little he taught congress to provide after a fashion for these things little by little he developed what he needed and by his own ingenuity and by seizing alertly every suggestion from others he supplied for better or worse one deficiency after another he had to deal with various governors and various colonies each with its own prejudices jealousies and shortcomings he had to arrange for new levies from a people unused to war and to settle with infinite anxiety and much wear and tear of mind and body the conflict as to rank among officers to whom he could apply no test but his own insight he had to organize and stimulate the arming of privateers which by preying on british commerce were destined to exercise such a powerful influence on the fate of the war it was neither showy nor attractive such work as this but it was very vital and it was done end of section eighty one Section 82 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 12, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 82. How Fort Moultrie was held for the colonies, 1776, by George Bancroft. On the morning of the 28th of June, 1776, a gentle sea breeze prognosticated the attack. Lee from Charleston, for the 10th or 11th time, charged Moultrie to finish the bridge for his retreat, promised him reinforcements which were never sent, and still meditated removing him from his command, while Moultrie, whose faculties under the outward show of imperturbable and even indolent calm, were strained to their utmost tension rode to visit his advanced guard on the east. Here the commander William Thompson of Orangeburg, of Irish descent, a native of Pennsylvania, but from childhood a citizen of South Carolina, a man of rare worth in private life, brave and intelligent as an officer, had at the extreme point posted fifty of the militia behind sand hills and myrtle bushes. A few hundred yards in the rear breastworks had been thrown up, which he guarded with 300 riflemen of his own regiment from Orangeburg and its neighborhood, with 200 of Clark's North Carolina Regiment under Horry, and the Raccoon Company of Riflemen. On his left he was protected by a morass, on his right by one 18-pounder and one brass 6-pounder, which overlooked the spot where Clinton would wish to land. Seeing the enemy's boats already in motion on the beach of Long Island, and the men of war loosing their topsails, Moultrie hurried back to his fort at full speed. He ordered the long roll to beat, and officers and men to their posts. His whole number, including himself and officers, was 435, of whom 22 were of the artillery, the rest of his own regiment, men who were bound to each other, to their officers and to him, by personal affection and confidence. Next to him in command was Isaac Mott, his major was the fearless and faultless Francis Marion. The fort was a square with a bastion at each angle, 
built of palmetto logs, dovetailed and bolted together, and laid in parallel rows sixteen feet asunder, with sand filled in between the rows. On the eastern and northern sides, the palmetto wall was only seven feet high, but it was surmounted by thick plank so as to be tenable against a scaling party. A traverse of sand extended from east to west. The southern and western curtains were finished with their platforms, on which cannon were mounted. The standard, which was advanced to the southeast bastion, displayed a flag of blue with a white crescent, on which was emblazoned liberty. The whole number of cannon in the fort, the bastions, and the two cavaliers was but thirty-one, of which no more than twenty-one could be at the same time brought into use. Of ammunition, there were but twenty-eight rounds for twenty-six cannon. At Hadrill's Point across the bay, Armstrong had about fifteen hundred men. The first regular South Carolina regiment under Christopher Gadsden occupied Fort Johnson, which stood on the most northerly part of James Island about three miles from Charleston, and within point-blank shot of the channel. Charleston was protected by more than 2,000 men. Half an hour after nine in the morning, the Commodore gave signal to Clinton that he should go on the attack. An hour later, the ships of war were underway. Gadsden, Coatsworth Pinckney, and the rest at Fort Johnson watched all their movements. In Charleston, the wharfs and waterside along the bay were crowded with troops under arms and lookers-on. Their adversary must be foiled, or their city may perish. Their houses be sacked and burned, and the savages on the frontier start from their lurking places. No grievous oppressions weighed down the industry of South Carolina. She came forth to the struggle from generous sympathy, and now the battle is to be fought for her chief city and the province. The thunder bomb, covered by the friendship, began the action by throwing shells, which it continued till more than sixty were discharged, of these, some burst in the air. One lighted on the magazine without doing injury. The rest sank in the morass or were buried in the sand within the fort. At about a quarter to eleven, the active, of twenty-eight guns, disregarding four or five shots fired at her while under sail, the Bristol with fifty guns, having on board Sir Peter Parker and Lord William Campbell, the governor, the experiment, also of fifty guns, and the Solibay, of twenty-eight, brought up within about 350 yards of the fort, let go their anchors with springs upon their cables, and began a most furious cannonade. Every sailor expected that two broadsides would end the strife, but the soft, fibrous, spongy wood of the palmetto withstood the rapid fire, and neither split nor splintered nor started, and the parapet was high enough to protect the men on the platforms. When broadsides from three or four of the men at war struck the logs at the same instant, the shock gave the merlons a tremor, but the pile remained uninjured. Moultrie had but one-tenth as many guns as were brought to bear on him, and was moreover obliged to stint the use of powder. His guns accordingly were fired very slowly, the officers taking aim and waiting always for the smoke to clear away, that they might point with more precision. Mind the Commodore, mind the fifty-gun ships, were the words that passed along the platform from officers and men. Shall I send for more powder? asked Moultrie of Mott. To be sure, said Mott. And Moultrie wrote to Lee, I believe we shall want more powder. At the rate we go on, I think we shall, but you can see that. Pray send us more if you think proper. More vessels were seen coming up, and cannon were heard from the northeast. Clinton had promised support. Not knowing what else to do, he directed the batteries on Long Island to open a cannonade, and several shells were thrown into Thompson's entrenchments, doing no damage beyond wounding one soldier. The firing was returned by Thompson with his one eighteen-pounder, but from the distance with little effect. At twelve o'clock, the light infantry, grenadiers, and the 15th Regiment embarked in boats while floating batteries and armed crafts got underway to cover the landing but the troops never so much as once attempted to land. The detachments had hardly left Long Island before it was ordered to disembark, for it was seen that the landing was impracticable and would have been the destruction of many brave men without the least probability of success. The American defenses were so well constructed, the approach so difficult, Thompson so vigilant, his men such skillful sharpshooters, that had the British landed, they would have been cut to pieces. It was impossible, says Clinton, to decide positively upon any plan, 
and he did nothing. An attack upon Hadrill's Point would have been still more desperate, though the Commodore, at Clinton's request, sent three frigates to cooperate with him in that design. The people of Charleston, as they looked from the battery with senses quickened by the nearness of danger, beheld the Sphinx, the Acteon, and the Siren, each of 28 guns, sailing as if to get between Hadrill's Point and the fort, so as to enfilade the works, and when the rebels should be driven from them to cut off their retreat. It was a moment of danger, for the fort on that side was unfinished, but the pilots kept too far to the south, so that they ran all the three upon a bank of sand known as the lower middle ground. Gladdened by seeing the frigates thus entangled, the beholders in the town were swayed alternately by fears and hopes. The armed inhabitants stood every one at his post, uncertain but that they might be called to immediate action, hardly daring to believe that Moultrie's small and ill-furnished garrison could beat off the squadron, when, behold, his flag disappears from their eyes. Fearing that his colors had been struck, they prepared to meet the invaders at the water's edge, trusting in providence and preferring death to slavery. In the fort, William Jasper, a sergeant, perceived that the flag had been cut down by a ball from the enemy and had fallen over the ramparts. Colonel, said he to Moultrie, don't let us fight without a flag. What can you do? asked Moultrie. The staff is broken off. Then, said Jasper, I'll fix it on a halberd and place it on the merlon of the bastion next the enemy. And leaping through an embrasure and braving the thickest fire from the ship, he took up the flag, returned with it safely, and planted it, as he had promised, on the summit of the merlon. The calm sea gleamed with light. The almost vertical sun of midsummer glared from a cloudless sky and the intense heat was increased by the blaze from the cannons on the platform. All of the garrison threw off their coats during the action, and some were nearly naked. Moultrie and several of the officers smoked their pipes as they gave their orders. The defense was conducted within sight of those whose watchfulness was to them the most animating. They knew that their movements were observed from the housetops of Charleston, by the veteran Armstrong, and the little army at Hadrill's Point, by Gadsden at Fort Johnson, who was almost near enough to take part in the engagement and was chafing with discontent at not being himself in the center of danger. Exposed to an incessant cannonade which seemed sufficient to daunt the bravest veterans, they stuck to their guns with the greatest constancy. Hit by a ball which entered through an embrasure, McDaniel called out to his brother soldiers, I am dying, but don't let the cause of liberty expire with me this day. The slow, intermittent fire, which was skillfully directed against the Commodore and the brave seamen on board the Bristol, shattered that ship and carried wounds and death. Never had a British squadron experienced so rude an encounter. Neither the tide nor the wind suffered them to retire. Once the springs on the cables of the Bristol were swept away, as she swung round with her stern toward the fort, she drew upon herself the fire of all the guns that could be brought to bear upon her. The slaughter was dreadful. Of all who in the beginning of the action were stationed on her quarter deck, not one escaped being killed or wounded. At one moment, it is said, the Commodore stood there alone, an example of unsurpassed intrepidity and firmness. Morris, his captain, having his forearm shattered by a chain shot and also receiving a wound in his neck, was taken into the cockpit, but after submitting to amputation, he insisted on being carried on the quarter deck once more where he resumed the command and continued it till he was shot through the body. When feeling dissolution near, he commended his family to the providence of God and the generosity of his country. Meanwhile, the eyes of the Commodore and of all on board his fleet were frequently and impatiently and vainly turned toward the army. If the troops would but cooperate, he was sure of gaining the island. For at about one o'clock he believed that he had silenced the guns of the rebels, and that the fort was on the point of being evacuated. If this were so, Clinton afterward asked him, why did you not take possession of the fort with the seamen and marines whom you practiced for the purpose? And Parker's rejoinder was that he had no prospect of speedy support from Clinton, but the pause was owing to the scarcity of powder, of which the little that remained to Moultrie was reserved for the musketry as a defense against an expected attack from the land forces. Lee should have replenished his stock, but in the heat of the action, Moultrie received from him this letter. If you should unfortunately expend your ammunition without beating off the enemy or driving them on ground, spike your guns and retreat. A little later, a better gift and a better message came from Rutledge, now at Charleston. 
I send you five hundred pounds of powder. You know our collection is not very great. Honor and victory to you and our worthy countrymen with you. Do not make too free with your cannon. Be cool and do mischief. These five hundred pounds of powder, with two hundred pounds from a schooner lying at the back of the fort, were all the supplies that Moultrie received. At three in the afternoon, Lee, on a report from his aide-de-camp Bird, sent Muhlenberg's Virginia riflemen to reinforce Thompson. A little before five, Moultrie was able to renew his fire. At about five, the Marines in the ship's tops, seeing a lieutenant with eight or ten men remove the heavy barricade from the gateway to the fort, thought that Moultrie and his party were about to retreat, but the gate was unbarred to receive a visit from Lee. The officers, half naked and begrimed with the day's work, respectfully laid down their pipes as he drew near. The general himself pointed two or three guns, after which he said to Moultrie, Colonel, I see you are doing very well here. You have no occasion for me. I will go up to town again. And thus he left the fort. When, at a few minutes past seven, the sun went down in a blaze of light, the battle was still raging, though the British showed signs of weariness. The inhabitants of Charleston, whom the evening sea breeze collected on the battery, could behold the flag of Crescent Liberty still proudly waving, and they continued gazing anxiously till the short twilight was suddenly merged in the deep darkness of a southern night, when nothing was seen but continued flashes, followed by peals, as it were, of thunder coming out from a heavy cloud. Many thousand shot were fired from the shipping, and hardly a hut or a tree on the island remained unhurt. But the works were very little damaged, and only one gun was silenced. The firing from the fort continued slowly, and the few shot they were able to send were heard to strike against the ship's timbers. Just after nine o'clock, a great part of his ammunition being expended in a cannonade of about ten hours, his people fatigued, the Bristol and the experiment nearly wrecks, the tide of ebb almost done, with no prospect of help from the army at the eastward, and no possibility of being of any further service, Sir Peter Parker resolved to withdraw. At half-past nine his ships slipped their cables and dropped down with the tide to their previous moorings. Of the 435 Americans in the fort who took part in this action, all but 11 remained alive, and of those but 26 were wounded. At so small a cost of life had Charleston been defended and a province saved. End of section 82. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 83 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The Defense of Fort Moultrie by e percy moran american artist eighteen sixty two painting page four hundred and ninety four in the autumn of seventeen seventy five king george himself set to work to plan a campaign which sir henry clinton was to carry out it seemed very easy on paper General Clinton was to issue a proclamation pardoning all but the leaders of the rebels, provided they did not refuse to give satisfactory tests of their obedience. He was to go from North Carolina to either South Carolina or Virginia, conquering as he went. He heard that the colonists were putting up some fortifications on Sullivan's Island, and he decided to attack these. It was written in the king's plan that the British land forces were to aid him, but they failed utterly, and the fleet was shattered. The defence of the fort was steady and brilliant, and the fort stood. The story of the illustration, the exploit of Sergeant William Jasper, is told in the following selection. The value to the colonists of this repulse of the British was very great. As Bancroft says, it kept seven regiments away from New York for two months, it gave security to Georgia and three years' peace to Carolina, it dispelled throughout the South the dread of British superiority, it drove the Loyalists into shameful obscurity. It was an announcement to the other colonies of the existence of South Carolina as a self-directing republic, a message of brotherhood and union. 
End of section 83. This recording is in the public domain. Section 84 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 12, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 84, The Declaration of Independence, 1776, by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. When the Patriots in Congress looked back upon the few battles that had yet taken place, they could feel that the Americans had begun well. Dr. Franklin, who was always cheerful and hopeful, described their situation in this way. In a letter to a friend in England, Britain, at the expense of three millions, has killed a hundred and fifty Yankees in this campaign, which is twenty thousand pounds ahead. And then at Bunker Hill, she gained a mile of ground, half of which she lost again by our taking post on Plowed Hill. During the same time, 60,000 children have been born in America. From these data, Dr. Price's mathematical head will easily calculate the time and expense necessary to kill us all and conquer our whole territory. This remark was printed in all the American papers and was very encouraging. But Dr. Franklin and all the wise men knew in their hearts that the Americans were unaccustomed to military discipline, that there was great jealousy between the different colonies, and that many of the richest men and most influential men were entirely opposed to separating from the mother country. Washington himself said, When I first took command of the army, I abhorred the idea of independence, but I am fully convinced that nothing else will save us. That was the feeling with which the Continental Congress came together to consider whether independence should be declared, and the people at large were becoming gradually prepared to support such a declaration, especially those who had read a book called Common Sense by Thomas Paine, which had been circulated very widely through the country and undoubtedly did more than any other book toward convincing the Americans that the time for separation had come. The leading colony at that time was Virginia, while Massachusetts and Pennsylvania came next in order. So it was thought best that the first proposal of independence should come from Virginia, and that it should be seconded from Massachusetts. On the 7th of June, 1776, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia moved these resolutions. That these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all alliance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. That is expedient forthwith to take the most effectual measures from forming foreign alliances, that a plan of confederation be prepared and transmitted to the respective colonies for their consideration and approbation. They were seconded by John Adams of Massachusetts. The first discussion of them showed that though the members generally were in favor of independence, yet there were some who thought the nation were not ready for it. So it was decided to postpone further discussion to the 1st of July. In the meanwhile, it was thought that the people of the colonies would show whether they were ready for independence or not, and show it very clearly they did. Before the end of that month, the people of every colony but one had either held meetings and voted that they wished for independence, or else had instructed their delegates to vote for it. And when the subject came up on that appointed day, New York was the only colony that did not vote to declare independence, and even New York did not vote against it. During this time of delay, a committee had been appointed to draw up a declaration of independence to be used if necessary. This committee consisted of Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, John Adams of Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Robert R. Livingston of New York. The declaration was written by Thomas Jefferson, though a very few verbal changes were made by Adams and Franklin. 
which may still be seen in their handwriting on the original document there was a long discussion in congress and the declaration was debated and criticized word by word and sometimes very severely attacked during this attack john adams was its chief defender while jefferson who had written it did not say a word he says in his journal during the debate i was sitting by dr franklin who observed that i was writhing a little under the acrimonious criticism of some of its parts and it was on that occasion that by way of comfort he told me the story of john thompson the hatter and his new sign this was a story told also by dr franklin in his autobiography in regard to a man who was about opening a shop for hats and who proposed to have a signboard with a hat painted on it and the inscription john thompson hatter makes and sells hats but almost every word of this inscription met with objection from somebody as being unnecessary and at last it was reduced to john thompson with the figure of a hat it was thus that franklin amused jefferson during the anxious hours when this most important measure was under discussion the declaration of independence was adopted july fourth seventeen seventy six though it was not signed until some weeks later when the members of congress came up to sign dr franklin was still ready with his cheerful wit john hancock who headed it said to the others we must be unanimous there must be no pulling different ways we must all hang together yes said franklin we must all hang together or else we shall all hang separately we can imagine how they may have laughed at this but it was really a dangerous responsibility that they were taking and no doubt there were some anxious hearts even among those who laughed but at last the great declaration was adopted without being much altered the principal change was in striking out a passage which condemned the king of england for his support and of the slave trade more severely than some of the southern members approved in its final form it was adopted by twelve colonies new york still declining to vote it had been privately resolved that when it was passed the bell of the old state house should be rung this was a bell which had been put up some twenty years before and which bore the inscription proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof so the old bell ringer placed his little boy at the hall door to await the signal of the doorkeeper and when independence was declared at last the doorkeeper gave the signal and the boy ran out exclaiming ring 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 then the bell rang out joyfully proclaiming liberty to all the land there was rejoicings everywhere and the declaration was read to each brigade in the army this is the way the pennsylvania journal described the excitement this afternoon july tenth the declaration of independence was read at the head of each brigade of the continental army posted at and in the vicinity of new york it was received everywhere with loud huzzas and the utmost demonstrations of joy and to-night the equestrian statue of george the third which tory pride and folly raised in the year seventeen seventy has by the sons of freedom been laid prostrate in the dirt the just desert of an ungrateful tyrant this was the courageous feeling with which the declaration of independence was received yet at this very time the enterprise seemed so daring and the condition of the american army was so poor that a adjutant general reed who from his position knew the state of military affairs better than any one else had written this a few days before every man from the general to the private acquainted with our true situation is exceedingly discouraged had i known the true position of affairs no consideration would have tempted me to take an active part in this scene End of section eighty four this recording is in the public domain Section 85 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alan Mapstone. The World Story, Volume 12, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 85. Nathan Hale. 1776 
by Francis Miles Finch. In September 1776, the British forces were encamped near Brooklyn, and it was of the utmost importance to Washington to get information about their numbers and the arrangement of their camp. Captain Nathan Hale, a young man of 21, volunteered to enter their lines. He disguised himself as a loyalist schoolmaster and got the information, but when about to return, he was captured and hanged under circumstances of peculiar cruelty. His last words were, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. The Editor To drumbeat and heartbeat a soldier marches by. There is colour in his cheek, there is courage in his eye. Yet to drumbeat and heartbeat, in a moment he must die. By the starlight and moonlight he seeks the Britain's camp. He hears the rustling flag and the armed sentry's tramp, and the starlight and the moonlight, his silent wanderings lamp. With slow tread and still tread he scans the tented line, and he counts the battery guns by the gaunt and shadowy pine, and his slow tread and still tread gives no warning sign. The dark wave, the plumed wave, it meets his eager glance, and it sparkles neath the stars like the glimmer of a lance, a dark wave, a plumed wave, on an emerald expanse. A sharp clang, a still clang, and terror in the sound, for the sentry falcon-eyed in the camp a spy hath found. With a sharp clang, a steel clang, the patriot is bound. With calm brow and steady brow he listens to his doom. In his look there is no fear, nor a shadow trace of gloom. But with calm brow and steady brow he robes him for the tomb. In the long night, the still night, he kneels upon the sod, and the brutal guards withhold e'en the solemn word of God. In the long night, the still night, he walks where Christ hath trod. Neath the blue morn, the sunny morn, he dies upon the tree, and he mourns that he can lose but one life for liberty, and in the blue morn, the sunny morn, his spirit wings are free. But his last words, his message words, they burn less friendly eye, should read how proud and calm a patriot could die. With his last words, his dying words, a soldier's battle cry. From fame leaf and angel leaf, from monument and urn, the sad of earth, the glad of heaven, his tragic fate shall learn. But on fame leaf and angel leaf, the name of Hale shall burn. End of section 85. This recording is in the public domain. Section 86 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 12. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 86. How Lafayette Came to America. 1777 by Edward Everett In the summer of 1776, and just after the American Declaration of Independence, Lafayette was stationed at Metz, a garrison town on the road from Paris to the German frontier, with the regiment to which he was attached, as a captain of dragoons, not then 19 years of age. The Duke of Gloucester, the brother of the King of England, happened to be on a visit to Metz, and a dinner was given to him by the commandant of the garrison. Lafayette was invited, with other officers, to the entertainment. Dispatches had just been received by the Duke from England, relating to the American affairs, the resistance of the colonists, and the strong measures adopted by the ministers to crush the rebellion. Among the details stated by the Duke of Gloucester was the extraordinary fact 
that these remote, scattered, and unprotected settlers of the wilderness had solemnly declared themselves an independent people. That word decided the fortunes of the enthusiastic listener, and not more distinctly was the Great Declaration a charter of political liberty to the rising states than it was a commission to their youthful champion to devote his life to the sacred cause. The details which he heard were new to him. The American contest was known to him before, but as a rebellion, a tumultuary affair in a remote transatlantic colony, he now with a promptness of perception, which even at this distance of time, strikes us as a little less than miraculous, addressed a multitude of inquiries to the Duke of Gloucester on the subject of the contest. His imagination was kindled at the idea of a civilized people struggling for political liberty. His heart was warmed with the possibility of drawing his sword in a good cause. Before he left the table, his course was mentally resolved on, and the brother of the King of England, unconsciously, no doubt, had the singular fortune to enlist from the French court and the French army, this gallant and fortunate champion in the then unpromising cause of the Colonial Congress. He immediately repaired to Paris to make further inquiries and arrangements toward the execution of his great plan. He confided it to two young friends, officers like himself, the Count Ségur and Viscount de Noailles, and proposed to them to join him. They shared his enthusiasm and determined to accompany him, but on consulting their families, they were refused permission. But they faithfully kept Lafayette's secret. Happily, shall I say, he was an orphan, independent of control and master of his own fortune, amounting to near $40,000 per annum. He next opened his heart to Count de Broglie, a marshal in the French army, to the experienced warrior, accustomed to the regular campaigns of European service, the project seemed rash and quixotic, and one which he could not countenance. Lafayette begged the Count at least not to betray him, as he was resolved, notwithstanding his disapproval of the project, to go to America. This the Count promised, adding, however, I saw your uncle fall in Italy, and I witnessed your father's death at the Battle of Winden and I would not be an accessory to the ruin of the only remaining branch of the family. He then used all the powers of argument which his age and experience suggested to him to dissuade Lafayette from the enterprise, but in vain. Finding his determination unalterable, he made him acquainted with the Baron de Calb, who, the Count knew, was about to embark for America. An officer of experience and merit, who as is well known, fell at the Battle of Camden. The Baron de Calp introduced Lafayette to Silas Steen, then agent of the United States in France, who explained to him the state of affairs in America and encouraged him in his project. Dean was but imperfectly acquainted with the French language and of matters somewhat repulsive. A less enthusiastic temper than that of Lafayette might have been somewhat chilled by the style of his intercourse. He had as yet not been acknowledged in any public capacity and was beset by the spies of the British ambassador. For these reasons, it was judged expedient that the visit of Lafayette should not be repeated and their further negotiations were conducted through the intervention of Mr. Carmichael, an American gentleman at the time in Paris. The arrangement was at length concluded, in virtue of which Dean took upon himself, without authority, but by a happy exercise of discretion to engage Lafayette to enter the American service with the rank of Major General. A vessel was about to be dispatched with arms and other supplies for the American army, and in this vessel it was settled that he should take passage. At this juncture, the news reached France of the evacuation of New York, the loss of Fort Washington, the calamitous retreat through New Jersey, and the other disasters of the campaign of 1776. The friends of America in France were in despair. The tidings, bad in themselves, were greatly exaggerated in the British gazettes. 
The plan of sending an armed vessel with munitions was abandoned. The cause, always doubtful, was now pronounced desperate, and Lafayette was urged by all who were privy to his project to give up an enterprise so wild and hopeless. Even our commissioners, for Dean had been joined by Dr. Franklin and Arthur Lee, told him they could not, in conscience, urge him to proceed. His answer was, My zeal and love of liberty have perhaps hitherto been the prevailing motive with me, but now I see a chance of usefulness which I had not anticipated. These supplies I know are greatly wanted by Congress. I have money. I will purchase a vessel to convey them to America, and in this vessel my companions and myself will take passage. Yes, fellow citizens, that I may repeat an exclamation uttered ten years ago by him who has now the honor to address you in the presence of an immense multitude who welcomed the nation's guest to the academic shades of Harvard and by them received with acclamations of approval and tears of gratitude. When he was told by our commissioners that they did not possess the means nor the credit of procuring a single vessel in all the ports of France, then exclaimed the gallant and generous youth, I will provide my own. And it is a literal fact that when our beloved country was too poor to offer him so much as a passage to her shores, he left in his tender youth the bosom of home, of happiness, of wealth, and of rank, to plunge in the dust and blood of our inauspicious struggle. In pursuance of the generous purpose thus conceived, the secretary of the Count de Broglie was employed by Lafayette to purchase and fit out a vessel at Bordeaux. And while these preparations were in train, with a few of averting suspicion from his movements, and passing the tedious interval of delay, he made a visit with a relative to his kinsman, the Marquis de Noailles, then the French ambassador in London. During their stay in Great Britain, they were treated with kindness by the king and persons of rank. But having, after a lapse of three weeks, learned that his vessel was ready at Bordeaux, Lafayette suddenly returned to France. This visit was of service to the youthful adventurer, in furnishing him an opportunity to improve himself in English language. But beyond this, a nice sense of honor forbade him from making use of the opportunity, which it afforded for obtaining military information that could be of utility to the American army. So far did he carry the scruple that he declined visiting the naval establishment at Portsmouth. On his return to France, he did not even visit Paris. But after three days passed at Passy, the residence of Dr. Franklin, he hastened to Bordeaux. Arrived at this place, he found that his vessel was not yet ready, and had the still greater mortification to learn that the spies of the British ambassador had penetrated his designs and made them known to the family of Lafayette and to the king from whom an order for his arrest was daily expected. Unprepared as his ship was, he instantly sailed in her to passage, the nearest port in Spain, where he proposed to wait for the vessel's papers. Scarcely had he arrived in that harbor when he was encountered by two officers with letters from his family and from the ministers and the royal order directing him to join his father-in-law at Marseille. The minister's letters reprimanded him for violating his oath of allegiance and failing in his duty to his king. Lafayette, in some of his letters to his friends about court, replied to this remark that the ministers might chide him with failing in his duty to the king when they learned to discharge theirs to the people. His family censored him for his desertion of his domestic duties, but his heroic wife, instead of joining in the reproach, shared his enthusiasm and encouraged his enterprise. He was obliged to return with the officers to Bordeaux and report himself to the commandant. While there, and engaged in communicating with his family and the court, in explanation and defense of his conduct, he learned from a friend at Paris that a positive prohibition of his departure might be expected from the king. No further time was to be lost, and no middle course pursued. He feigned a willingness to yield to the wishes of his family, and started as for Marseille, 
with one of the officers who was to accompany him to America. Scarcely had they left the city of Bordeaux when he assumed the dress of a courier, mounted a horse, and rode forward to procure relays. They soon quitted the road to Marseille and struck into that which leads to Spain. On reaching Bayonne, they were detained two or three hours. While the companion of Lafayette was employed in some important commission in the city, he himself lay on the straw in the stable. At Saint-Jean-de-Luz, he was recognized by the daughter of the person who kept the post-house. She had observed him a few days before as he passed from Spain to Bordeaux. Perceiving that he was discovered and not daring to speak to her, he made her a signal to keep silence. She complied with the intimidation, and when, shortly after he had passed on, his pursuers came up, she gave them an answer which baffled their penetration and enabled Lafayette to escape into Spain. He was instantly on board his ship and at sea with eleven officers in his train. It would take one beyond the limits of the occasion to repeat the various casualties and exposures of his passage, which lasted sixty days. His vessel had cleared out for the West Indies, but Lafayette directed the captain to steer for the United States, which, especially as he had a large pecuniary adventure of his own on board, he declined doing. By threats to remove him from his command and promises to indemnify him for the loss of his property, should they be captured, Lafayette prevailed upon the captain to steer his course for the American coast, where at least they happily arrived, having narrowly escaped two British vessels at war, which were cruising in that quarter. They made the coast near Georgetown, South Carolina. It was late in the day before they could approach so near land as to leave the vessel. Anxious to tread the American soil, Lafayette with some of his fellow officers entered the ship's boat and was rowed at nightfall to shore. A distant light guided them in their landing and advanced into the country. Arriving near the house from which the lights proceeded, an alarm was given by the watchdogs, and they were mistaken by those within for a marauding party, from the enemy's vessels hovering on the coast. The Baron de Calpe, however, had a good knowledge of the English language, acquired on a previous visit to America, and was soon able to make known who they were and what was their errand. On this they were of course readily admitted and cordially welcomed. The house in which they found themselves was that of Major Huger, a citizen of worth, hospitality and patriotism, by whom every good office was performed to the adventurous strangers. He provided the next day the means of conveying Lafayette and his companions to Charleston, where they were received with enthusiasm by the magistrates and the people. As soon as possible, they proceeded by land to Philadelphia. On his arrival there, with the eagerness of a youth anxious to be employed upon his errand, he sent his letters to our townsman, Mr. Lovell, chairman of the Committee of Foreign Relations. He called the next day at the Hall of Congress and asked to see this gentleman. Mr. Lovell came out to him stated that so many foreigners offered themselves for employment in the American army that Congress was greatly embarrassed to find them commands, that the finances of the country required the most rigid economy, and that he feared, in the present case, there was little hope of success. Lafayette perceived that the worthy chairman had made up his report without looking at the papers. He explained to him that his application, if granted, would lay no burden upon the finances of Congress, and addressed a letter to the president, in which he expressed a wish to enter the American army on the condition of serving without pay or emolument, and on the footing a volunteer. These conditions removed the chief obstacles alluded to in reference to the appointment of foreign officers. The letters brought by Lafayette made known to Congress his high connections and his large means of usefulness, and without an hour's delay, he received from them a commission of major general in the American army a month before he was 20 years of age. End of section 86. This recording is in the public domain. Section 87 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by April 6090. California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 12. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 87. Why Cornwallis Failed to Bag the Old Fox. 1777. By John Fisk. In December 1776, Cornwallis thought the war was practically over and had packed his baggage ready to sail for England when he learned that Washington, who always made the move that no one expected, had crossed the Delaware River in the midst of floating ice and had captured a thousand Hessian soldiers at Trenton, the editor. Cornwallis rode post-haste to Princeton, where he found Dunop throwing up earthworks on the morning of January the 2nd. Cornwallis advanced with 8,000 men upon Trenton, but his march was slow and painful. He was exposed during most of the day to a galling fire from parties of riflemen hidden in the woods by the roadside, and Green, with the force of 600 men and two field pieces, contrived so to harass and delay him that he did not reach Trenton till late in the afternoon. By that time, Washington had withdrawn his whole force beyond the Asunpink, a small river which flows into the Delaware just south of Trenton, and had guarded the bridge and the fords by batteries admirably placed. The British made several attempts to cross, but were repulsed with some slaughter, and as their day's work had sorely fatigued them, Cornwallis thought best to wait until tomorrow, while he sent his messenger, post-haste, back to Princeton, to bring up a force of nearly two thousand men, which he had left behind there. With this added strength, he felt sure that he could force the passage of the stream above the American position, when by turning Washington's right flank, he could fold him back against the Delaware, and thus compel him to surrender. Cornwallis accordingly went to bed in high spirits. At last we have run down the old fox, said he, and we will bag him in the morning. The situation was, indeed, a very dangerous one. But when the British general called his antagonist an old fox, he did him no more than justice. In its union of slyness with audacity, the movement which Washington now executed strongly reminds one of Stonewall Jackson. He understood perfectly well what Cornwallis intended to do, but he knew at the same time that detachments of the British army must have been left behind at Princeton and New Brunswick to guard the stores. From the size of the army before him, he rightly judged that these rear detachments must be too small to withstand his own force. By overwhelming one or both of them, he could compel Cornwallis to retreat upon New York, while he himself might take up an impregnable position on the heights about Morristown, from which he might threaten the British line and hold their whole army in check. A most brilliant and daring scheme for a commander to entertain while in such a perilous position as Washington was that night. But the manner in which he began by extricating himself was not the least brilliant part of the maneuver. All night long the American campfires were kept burning brightly, and small parties were busily engaging in throwing up entrenchments near the Asunpink that the British sentinels could plainly hear the murmur of their voices and the thud of their spade and pickaxe. While this was going on, the whole American army marched swiftly up the south bank of the little stream, passed around Cornwallis's left wing to his rear, and gained the road to Princeton. Toward sunrise, as the British detachment was coming down the road from Princeton to Trenton, in obedience to Cornwallis's order, its van under Colonel Mahood met the foremost column of Americans approaching under General Mercer. As he caught sight of the Americans, Mawood thought that they must be a party of fugitives, and hastened to intercept them. But he was soon undeceived. The Americans attacked with vigor, and a sharp fight was sustained, with varying fortunes, until Mercer was pierced by a bayonet, and his men began to fall back in some confusion. Just at this critical moment, Washington came galloping upon the field and rallied the troops and as the entire forces on both sides had now come up, the fight became general. In a few minutes the British were routed, and their line was cut in two. 
one half fleeing toward trenton the other half toward new brunswick there was little slaughter as the whole fight did not occupy more than twenty minutes the british lost about two hundred in, in killed and wounded with three hundred prisoners and their cannon the american loss was less than one hundred shortly before sunrise the men who had been left in the camp on the Ossenpink to feed the fires and making noise beat a hasty retreat and found their way to princeton by circuitous paths when cornwallis got up he could hardly believe his eyes here was nothing before him but an empty camp the american army had vanished and whither it had gone he could not imagine but his perplexity was soon relieved by the booming of distant cannon on the princeton road and the game which the old fox had played him all at once became apparent nothing was to be done but to retreat upon new brunswick with all possible haste and save the stores there his road led back through princeton and from mahud's fugitives he soon heard the story of the morning's disaster his march was hindered by various impediments a thaw had set in so that the little streams had swelled into roaring torrents difficult to ford and the american army which had passed over the road before daybreak had not forgotten to destroy the bridges by the time that cornwallis and his men reached princeton wet and weary the americans had already left it but they had not gone on to new brunswick washington had hoped to seize the stores there but the distance was eighteen miles his men were wretchedly shod and too tired to march rapidly and it would not be prudent to risk a general engagement when his main purpose could be secured without one for these reasons washington turned northward to the heights of morristown while cornwallis continued his retreat to new brunswick frederick the great felt a hearty admiration for washington's maneuvers in new jersey and three years later sent his own portrait to the american soldier with the inscription from the oldest general in europe to the greatest general on earth end of section eighty seven this recording is in the public domain section eighty eight of the united states read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone the marching song of stark's men seventeen seventy seven by edward everett hale in august seventeen seventy seven burgoyne's advance from the north was stopped for want of horses and provisions hearing that the provincials had collected supplies at the little village of bennington vermont burgoyne sent out a strong detachment of germans to seize them when colonel stark a veteran of the seven years war heard of their advance he hastily collected a body of farmers and backwoodsmen and by forced marches caught and engaged the enemy at bennington of the german force of one thousand men less than a hundred escaped to tell their comrades of their disastrous encounter with the yankee farmers the editor march 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 from sunrise till it's dark and let no man straggle on the way march 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 as we follow old john stark for the old man needs us all to-day load 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 three buckshot and a ball with the hymn tune for a wad to make them stay but let no man dare to fire till he gives the word to all let no man let the buckshot go astray fire 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 all along the line when we meet those bloody hessians in array they shall have every grain from this powder horn of mine unless the cowards turn and run away home 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 when the fight is fought and won to the home where the women watch and pray to tell them how john sark finished what he had begun and to hear them thank our God for the day. End of section eighty eight. This recording is in the public domain. Section eighty nine of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
for more information nor to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume twelve the united states edited by eva march tappan section eighty nine burgoyne's surrender seventeen seventy seven by john fisk on the morning of october seven leaving the rest of his army in camp burgoyne advanced with fifteen hundred picked men to turn the american left small as the force was its quality was superb and with it were the best commanders phillips rydessel fraser balcaris and ackland such a compact force so ably led might manoeuvre quickly if on sounding the american position on the left they should find it too strong to be forced they might swiftly retreat at all events the movement would cover a foraging party which burgoyne had sent out and this was no small matter arnold too the fighting general it was reported held no command and gates was known to be a sluggard such thoughts may have helped to shape the conduct of the british commander on this critical morning but the scheme was swiftly overturned as the british came on their right was suddenly attacked by morgan while the new england regulars with three thousand new york militia assailed them in front after a short sharp fight against overwhelming numbers their whole line was broken and fraser sought to form a second line a little farther back on the west border of freeman's farm though the ranks were badly disordered and all their cannon were lost at this moment arnold who had been watching from the heights saw that a well-directed blow might not only ruin this retreating column but also shatter the whole british army quick as thought he sprang upon his horse and galloped to the scene of action he was greeted with deafening hurrahs and the men leaping with exultation at sight of their beloved commander rushed upon fraser's half-formed line at the same moment while morgan was still pressing on the british right one of his marksmen shot general fraser who fell mortally wounded just as arnold charged with mad fury upon his line the british thus assailed in front and flank were soon pushed off the field arnold next attacked lord balcaris who had retired behind entrenchments at the north of freeman's farm but finding the resistance here too strong he swept by and charged upon the canadian auxiliaries who occupied a position just north of balcaris and covered the left wing of brayman's forces at the extreme right of the british camp the canadians soon fled leaving brayman uncovered and arnold forthwith rushed against brayman on the left just as morgan who had prolonged his flanking march assailed him on the right brayman was slain and his force routed the british right wing was crushed and their whole position taken in reverse and made untenable just at this moment a wounded german soldier lying on the ground took aim at arnold and slew his horse while the ball passed through the general's left leg that had been wounded at quebec and fractured the bone a little above the knee as arnold fell one of his men rushed up to bayonet the wounded soldier who had shot him when the prostrate general cried for god's sake don't hurt him he's a fine fellow the poor german was saved and this was the hour when benedict arnold should have died his fall and the gathering twilight stopped the progress of the battle but the american victory was complete and decisive nothing was left for burgoyne but to get the wreck of his army out of the way as quickly as possible and the next day he did so making a slow retreat upon saratoga in the course of which his soldiers burned general schuyler's princely country house with its barns and granaries as the british retreated general gates steadily closed in upon them with his overwhelming forces which now numbered twenty thousand gates to give him due credit knew how to be active after the victory although when fighting was going on he was a general of sedentary habits when arnold rushed down at the critical moment to complete the victory of saratoga 
gates sent out major armstrong to stop him call back that fellow said gates or he will be doing something rash but the eager arnold had out galloped the messenger and came back only when his leg was broken and the victory won in the meantime gates sat at his headquarters forgetful of the battle that was raging below while he argued the merits of the american revolution with a wounded british officer sir francis clerk who had been brought in and laid upon the commander's bed to die and this seems to have been all that the commanding general contributed to the crowning victory of saratoga when burgoyne reached the place where he had crossed the hudson he found a force of three thousand americans with several batteries of cannon occupying the hills on the other side so that it was now impossible to cross a council of war decided to abandon all the artillery and baggage push through the woods by night and effect a crossing higher up by fort edward where the great river begins to be fordable but no sooner had this plan been made than word was brought that the americans were guarding all the fords and had also planted detachments in a strong position to the northward between fort edward and fort george the british army in short was surrounded a brisk cannonade was opened upon it from the east and south while morgan's sharpshooters kept up a galling fire in the rear some of the women and wounded men were sent for safety to a large house in the neighbourhood where they took refuge in the cellar and there the baroness riot dessel tells us how she passed six dismal nights and days crouching in a corner near the doorway with her three little children clinging about her while every now and then with hideous crashing a heavy cannon-ball passed through the room overhead the cellar became crowded with crippled and dying men but little food could be obtained and the suffering from thirst was dreadful it was only a few steps to the river but every man who ventured out with a bucket was shot dead by virginia rifles that never missed their aim at last the brave wife of a british soldier volunteered to go and thus the water was brought again and again for the americans would not fire at a woman and now while burgoyne's last ray of hope was dying and while the veteran phillips declared himself heart-broken at the misery which he could not relieve where was sir henry clinton he had not thought it prudent to leave new york until after the arrival of three thousand soldiers whom he expected from england these men arrived on the twenty ninth of september but six days more elapsed before sir henry had taken them up the river and landed them near putnam's headquarters at peekskill in a campaign of three days he outwitted that general carried two of the forts after obstinate resistance and compelled the americans to abandon the others and thus laid open the river so that british ships might go up to albany on the eighth of october sir henry wrote to burgoyne from fort montgomery new zivoisi and nothing between us and gates i sincerely hope this little success of ours will facilitate your operations this dispatch was written on a scrap of very thin paper and encased in an oval silver bullet which opened with a tiny screw in the middle sir henry then sent general vaughan with several frigates and the greater part of his force to make all haste for albany as they passed up the river the next day they could not resist the temptation to land and set fire to the pretty village of kingston then the seat of the state legislature george clinton governor of the state just retreating from his able defence of the captured forts hastened to protect the village but came up only in time to see it in flames from one end to the other just then sir henry's messenger as he skulked by the roadside was caught and taken to the governor he had been seen swallowing something so they gave him an emetic and obtained the silver bullet the dispatch was read the bearer was hanged to an apple tree and burgoyne weary with waiting for the news that never came at last sent a flag of truce to general gates inquiring what terms of surrender would be accepted gates first demanded an unconditional surrender but on burgoyne's indignant refusal he consented to make terms and the more readily no doubt since he knew what had just happened in the highlands though his adversary did not after three days of discussion the terms of surrender were agreed upon just as burgoyne was about to sign the articles a tory made his way into camp with hearsay news that part of clinton's army was approaching albany 
the subject was then anxiously reconsidered by the british officers and an interesting discussion ensued as to whether they had so far pledged their faith to the surrender that they could not in honour draw back the majority of the council decided that their faith was irrevocably pledged and burgoyne yielded to this opinion though he did not share it for he did not feel quite clear that the rumoured advance of clinton could now avail to save him in any case in this he was undoubtedly right the american army with its daily accretions of militia had now grown to more than twenty thousand and armed yeomanry were still pouring in by the hundred a diversion threatened by less than three thousand men who were still more than fifty miles distant could hardly have averted the doom of the british army the only effect which it did produce was perhaps to work upon the timid gates and induce them to offer easy terms in order to hasten the surrender on the seventeenth of october accordingly the articles were signed exchanged and put in execution it was agreed that the british army should march out of camp with the honours of war and pile their arms at an appointed place they should then march through massachusetts to boston from which port they might sail for europe it being understood that none of them should serve again in america during the war all the officers might retain their small arms and no one's private luggage should be searched or molested at burgoyne's earnest solicitation the american general consented that these proceedings should be styled a convention instead of a surrender in imitation of the famous convention of gloucester seven by which the duke of cumberland twenty years before had sought to save his feelings while losing his army beleaguered by the french in hanover the soothing phrase has been well remembered by british historians who to this day continue to speak of burgoyne's surrender as the convention of saratoga in carrying out the terms of the convention both gates and his soldiers showed praiseworthy delicacy as the british marched off to a meadow by the riverside and laid down their arms the americans remained within their lines refusing to add to the humiliation of a gallant enemy by standing and looking on as the disarmed soldiers then passed by the american lines says lieutenant anbury one of the captured officers i did not observe the least disrespect or even a taunting look but all was mute astonishment and pity burgoyne stepped up and handed his sword to gates simply saying the fortune of war general gates has made be your prisoner the american general instantly returned the sword replying i shall always be ready to testify that it has not been through any fault of your excellency when baron ryadessel had been presented to gates and the other generals he sent for his wife and children set free at last from the dreadful cellar the baroness came with some trepidation into the enemy's camp but the only look she saw upon any face was one of sympathy as i approached the tents she says a noble-looking gentleman came toward me and took the children out of the wagon embraced and kissed them and then with tears in his eyes helped me also to alight presently he said it may be embarrassing to you to dine with so many gentlemen if you will come with your children to my tent i will give you a frugal meal but one that will at least be seasoned with good wishes oh sir i cried you must surely be a husband and a father since you show me so much kindness i then learned that it was general schuyler schuyler had indeed come with unruffled soul to look on while the fruit which he had sown with the gallant aid of stark and herkimer arnold and morgan was plucked by an unworthy rival he now met burgoyne who was naturally pained and embarrassed at the recollection of the beautiful house which his men had burned a few days before in a speech in the house of commons some months later burgoyne told how schuyler received him i expressed to general schuyler says burgoyne my regret at the event which had happened and the reasons which had occasioned it he desired me to think no more of it saying that the occasion justified it according to the rules of war he did more he sent an aide-de-camp to conduct me to albany in order as he expressed it to procure me better quarters than a stranger might be able to find this gentleman conducted me to a very elegant house and to my great surprise presented me to mrs schuyler and her family and in this general's house i remained during my whole stay at albany with a table of more than twenty covers for me and my friends and every other possible demonstration of hospitality madame rydessel was also invited to stay with the schuylers and when first she arrived in the house one of her little girls exclaimed oh mamma is this the palace that papa was to have when he came to america as the schuylers understood german the baroness coloured but all laughed pleasantly and put her at ease the captured army was never sent home the officers were treated as prisoners of war and from time to time were exchanged burgoyne was allowed to go to england in the spring and while still a prisoner on parole he took his seat in parliament and became conspicuous among the defenders of the american cause 
the troops were detained in the neighborhood of boston until the autumn of seventeen seventy eight when they were all transferred to charlottesville in virginia here a rude village was built on the brow of a pleasant ridge of hills and gardens were laid out and planted much kind assistance was rendered in all this work by thomas jefferson who was then living close by on his estate at monticello and did everything in his power to make things comfortable for soldiers and officers two years afterward when virginia became the seat of war some of them were removed to winchester in the shenandoah valley to frederick in maryland and to lancaster in pennsylvania those who wished to return to europe were exchanged or allowed to escape the greater number especially of the germans preferred to stay in this country and become american citizens before the end of seventeen eighty three they had dispersed in all directions such was the strange sequel of a campaign which whether we consider the picturesqueness of its incidents or the magnitude of its results was one of the most memorable in the history of mankind its varied scenes framed in landscapes of grand and stirring beauty had brought together such types of manhood as the feathered mohawk sachem the helmeted brunswick dragoon and the blue frock yeoman of new england types of ancient barbarism of the militancy bequeathed from the middle ages and of the industrial democracy that is to possess and control the future of the world these men had mingled in a deadly struggle for the strategic centre of the atlantic coast of north america and now the fight had ended in the complete and overwhelming defeat of the forces of george the third four years indeed four years of sore distress and hope deferred were yet to pass before the fruits of this great victory could be gathered the independence of the united states was not yet won but the triumph at saratoga set in motion a train of events from which the winning of independence was destined surely to follow end of section eighty nine this recording is in the public domain Section ninety of the United States read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The United States, Part thirteen War in the West and on the Ocean. Historical note During the Revolution, the border warfare in the West was constant and pitiless, and from Kentucky to the Great Lakes, the outlying settlements were devastated by the Tories and their Indian allies in seventeen seventy eight the border villages of new york and pennsylvania were so cruelly harried by chief brant and colonel butler that in the following year general sullivan led an army into the country of the six nations the most powerful of the indian tribes and avenged the massacres so sternly that this great tribe never recovered its former position in seventeen seventy eight the british planned to unite the indian tribes and destroy the little settlements in what was then the far west or what is now indiana and illinois this might well have come to pass if through the efforts of a young virginian surveyor named george rogers clark they had not been driven back and vincent and other places captured this one man saved the vast expanse of country between the ohio and the great lakes and as far west as the mississippi at the time of the revolution the colonies had of course no navy of their own and in consequence the coast was practically at the mercy of the english congress felt this handicap early in the war but little was done except the equipment of privateers and cruisers for the destruction of british commerce during the first half of the war more than six hundred british vessels were taken by these privateers but during the same period nine hundred american vessels were captured by british cruisers and the fisheries and coasting trade of new england were almost destroyed there was one captain who more than all others terrorized british shipping and spread the fame of american seamen throughout europe john paul jones a scotch sailor who had settled in virginia shortly before the outbreak of hostilities as commander of the ranger in seventeen seventy eight and the bonhomme richard in seventeen seventy nine he wrought havoc along the british coast burned the shipping in british ports and finally captured the man-of-war serapis after one of the most desperate sea fights in history End of section 90. This recording is in the public domain. Section 91 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the world story volume twelve the united states edited by eva march tappan section ninety one how daniel boone saved boonesborough 
seventeen seventy five by charles c b seymour in the spring of the year seventeen seventy five boone was employed by a company of land speculators who imagined they had secured a valid title to the land in kentucky by virtue of a deed of purchase from the cherokees to survey and lay out roads in kentucky he was placed at the head of a body of well-armed men and proceeded to his work with great willingness the party had arrived within fifteen miles of boonesborough when they were fired on by indians and suffered a loss of two killed and two wounded three days later they were again attacked and had two killed and three wounded boone was not the sort of man to be deterred by a calamity even of this severe kind he pressed forward and on a favorable site erected a fort called boonesborough sufficiently strong and large to afford protection against any further attack he was so well satisfied with its security that shortly afterward he returned to clinch river for his wife and family they arrived safely his wife and daughters being the first white women that ever stood on the banks of the kentucky river a number of families followed their example and the little place soon became cheerful and populated the indians did not venture to attack the settlers so long as they remained within sight of the fort but it was very well known that they hovered about the outskirts ready for a descent on any unhappy white who might expose himself unguardedly to their vengeance the men were suspicious and careful and never went out without their rifles in spite of these precautions a most thrilling and tragic incident occurred on the fourteenth of july seventeen seventy six three young girls belonging to the fort one of them was boone's daughter heedlessly crossed the river in a canoe late in the afternoon when they got to the other side they commenced playing and splashing with the paddles as gay young girls unconscious of danger might naturally do until the canoe floating with the current drifted close to the shore which at this part was thickly covered with trees and shrubs concealed in this natural ambuscade lay three savage indians they had been watching every motion of the girls and were prepared now to seize their opportunity one of the coppery rascals dropped stealthily into the stream caught hold of the rope that hung from the bow of the canoe and drew it out of view of the fort the girls aroused to a sense of their danger screamed as loud as they could and were heard at the fort but before assistance could come their captors hurried them on shore and bore them to the interior next morning by daylight says colonel floyd who was one of the actors in what he describes we were on the track but found they had totally prevented our following them by walking some distance apart through the thickest canes they could find we observed their course and on which side they had left their sign and travelled upward of thirty miles we then imagined that they would be less cautious in travelling and made a turn in order to cross their trace and had gone but a few miles before we found their tracks in a buffalo path pursued and overtook them on going about ten miles just as they were kindling a fire to cook our study had been more to get the prisoners without giving the indians time to murder them after they discovered us than to kill them we discovered each other nearly at the same time four of us fired and all rushed on them which prevented them from carrying away anything except one shotgun without ammunition mr boone and myself had a pretty fair shot just as they began to move off i am well convinced i shot one through and the one he shot dropped his gun mine had none the place was very thick with canes and being so much elated on recovering the three little broken-hearted girls prevented our making further search we sent them off without their moccasins and not one of them was so much as a knife or a tomahawk the simplicity of this narrative exceeds its clearness but with all its involutions is it not graphic and does it not convey an excellent idea of the rough indifference to danger so characteristic of true pioneer life after this it was necessary to be doubly watchful for the indians became more aggressive and apprehensions were felt that a general attack would be made on the fortified stations these fears appeared to be so well founded that it was only the oldest and bravest of the pioneers who could withstand their influence the land speculators and other adventurers to the number of nearly three hundred left the country and newcomers although prepared for danger were with difficulty prevailed upon to remain the year seventeen seventy seven passed in this gloomy way marked only by frequent attacks on the various stations by the indians two attempts were made on the fort but each time the besiegers were beaten off 
the brave little garrison lost two men killed and five wounded with all means of transit cut off by their wary foes great privations were necessarily suffered by the little band the immediate necessaries of life they could of course procure but some articles which were essential to the preservation of health they were without this was especially the case with regard to salt boone while in the wilderness could do without this article of luxury but the families in the fort sorely felt its need and all kinds of efforts were made to obtain a supply at length it was determined to fit out an expedition consisting of thirty men with boone at its head to effect this desirable object it was necessary to proceed to the lower blue licks on licking river and there manufacture the article which in due course was to be forwarded by pack-horses to the fort the enterprise which seemed at first to promise success cost boone and his companions their liberty one day while hunting a short distance from his comrades he was surprised by a party of indians one hundred and two in number he attempted to escape but their swiftest runners were put on his trail and he soon abandoned all idea of doing so the sagacity and presence of mind of the old hunter had now to be exercised he parleyed with the indians professed all sorts of friendship for them succeeded in gaining their confidence and finally made honourable terms for the surrender of his men who became prisoners of war boone has been blamed for not offering resistance but a moment's reflection will demonstrate that the course he pursued was the wisest and safest had he offered resistance his little band would have been overpowered and the next point of attack would have been the fort which from the absence of the garrison would have been entirely at the mercy of the savages to avert a certain massacre he surrendered his men after having made excellent conditions for the safety of their lives the generous usage the indians had promised before in my capitulation says boone was afterward fully complied with and we proceeded with them as prisoners to old chillicothe the principal indian town on little miami where we arrived after an uncomfortable journey in very severe weather on the eighteenth of february and received as good treatment as prisoners could expect from savages on the tenth day of march following i and ten of my men were conducted by forty indians to detroit where we arrived on the thirtieth day and were treated by governor hamilton the british commander at that post with great humanity the governor endeavoured to obtain boone's liberation by purchase but his captors were not willing to part with him he had so ingratiated himself in their good graces that they were determined to have him for a chief and insisted on carrying him back to their town for the purpose of adoption he bade farewell to his friends in detroit and under the friendly escort of his pertinacious admirers returned to chillicothe where he was adopted by an illustrious individual of the name of blackfish to supply the place of a deceased son and warrior he was treated with great kindness and in a short time became universally popular he was careful to avoid all cause for suspicion and to appear constantly happy although of course he was forever dreaming of his wife and family and praying for the happy day that should enable him to escape to them early in the following june he was taken to the salt springs on the scioto to assist in making salt on his return he was alarmed to see a fearful array of four hundred and fifty warriors and still more so when he discovered that they were bound on an expedition against boonesborough he determined to effect his escape and on the following morning the sixteenth of june seventeen seventy eight he arose and went forth as usual without exciting suspicion he never returned and blackfish had to adopt another son boone succeeded in reaching the fort in safety his sudden appearance greatly astonished the people there for they had given him up and his wife with some of the children had actually departed for north carolina not a moment was to be lost in making the necessary preparations for the defence of the settlement the fort which had fallen into a very rickety condition was put in thorough repair and the garrison mustered and drilled so as to be in perfect readiness the indians however changed their minds alarmed probably at the escape of boone they postponed their expedition for three weeks but in the meantime they made some additions to their strength in the shape of french and canadian officers on the seventh of september the indian army numbering four hundred and forty-four with captain duquesne and eleven other canadians appeared before boonesborough the indians were commanded by boone's would-be adopted father mr blackfish and the canadians by captain duquesne when this alarming foe had assembled before the unhappy little fort a summons was issued to surrender in the name of his britannic majesty the garrison consisted of between sixty and seventy men and a large number of women and children if they had surrendered it would have been nothing remarkable but they did not even think of doing such a thing boone expected reinforcements from holston and it became necessary therefore to procure as much delay as possible 
for this purpose he desired that he might have two days to consider the proposition of his britannic majesty strange as it may appear this proposition was acceded to about five minutes were sufficient for the garrison to arrive at a determination and this was that they would fight it out to the last all the cows and horses were collected within the fort and every vessel filled with water from the spring the latter task being performed by the ladies when the hour arrived for giving an answer to bold captain duquesne it was done in this wise by boone we laugh at your formidable preparations but thank you for giving notice and time to prepare for defence captain duquesne was not incensed at this reply but still insisted on a capitulation he declared his orders from colonel hamilton were to take the garrison captives to treat them as prisoners of war and not to injure much less to murder them and that they had horses to take the women and children and all others who could not bear the fatigue of travelling on foot he then proposed that if the garrison would depute nine persons to come out of the fort and hold a treaty the terms should be liberal it is impossible at this time after the demise of every person concerned in the affair to account for the singular course of captain duquesne and his indian allies although duquesne's affectionate course savoured of treachery boone thought it desirable to accede to his proposition as it would at least secure a little more delay nine commissioners were selected for the purpose of discussing the treaty boone being one of the number a plot of ground in front of the fort was selected for the conference all parties to go unarmed before leaving for this hazardous interview boone took the precaution to place a number of experienced riflemen in advantageous positions so that if the commissioners retreated hastily they might be protected the parties met and the treating proposed was of the most liberal kind it simply demanded that the residents and garrison of the fort should acknowledge the british authorities and take the oath of allegiance to the king in return for which they were to remain unmolested after these points had been settled the indians proposed that as a commemoration of the joyous occasion they should revive an ancient custom of their tribe which consisted of two indians shaking hands with one white man at the same moment boone and his companions knew exactly what this meant but they did not betray any uneasiness eighteen stalwart muscular indians now advanced and in the way prescribed by the very ancient custom before mentioned endeavoured to drag off the white men but the iron frames of the pioneers were braced for a struggle being without weapons they appealed to their anglo-saxon knowledge of fisticuffs and in a very little while had tumbled the red villains in the dust in the excitement which followed they made good their retreat to the fort and the riflemen immediately opened a murderous fire to keep off the pursuers hostilities now commenced on both sides the indians kept up a brisk fire at the fort but owing to its favourable situation could not effect much mischief the garrison on the contrary never fired a charge without an especial object a regular siege conducted in the usual indian style was kept up for nine days but with no result the kentuckians never flinched for a moment even the women assisted in the defence for they loaded the rifles moulded bullets and supplied refreshments on one occasion the fort was fired by the enemy but a heroic young man extinguished the flames in spite of a shower of bullets which greeted his appearance with the buckets on the roof foiled in this the indians under the direction of the canadians commenced digging a mine but boone was equal to this emergency he began a countermine and threw all the dirt into their works so that they had the pleasure of shoveling it away before they could make the slightest progress on the twentieth of september they raised the siege and took their departure after having suffered a loss of thirty-seven killed and many more wounded the loss on the pioneer side was two killed and four wounded it would not have been so great but for the desertion of a vagabond negro who went over to the enemy carrying with him an excellent rifle during the siege this rascal placed himself in a tree on the other side of the river and was able owing to the excellence of his weapon to fire into the fort he had killed one and wounded another when boone caught a glimpse of his woolly head it was sufficient the next moment sambo rolled from the tree after the retreat his body was found and in the centre of the forehead an explanatory hole told the story of his death the old hunter brought him down at a distance of one hundred and seventy-five yards end of section ninety one this recording is in the public domain section ninety two of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 12, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 92. 
A Campaign Through the Water, 1778, by George Rogers Clark. By means of the two bold campaigns of George Rogers Clark, the United States was, at the close of the Revolution, in possession of the land west of the Ohio, and so was able to secure the Mississippi instead of the Ohio as a western boundary. The Editor Everything being ready, on the 5th of February, after receiving a lecture and absolution from the priest, we crossed the Kaskaskia River with 170 men, marched about three miles and encamped, where we lay until the 7th and set out. The weather wet, but fortunately not cold for the season, and a great part of the plains under water several inches deep. It was difficult and very fatiguing marching. My object was now to keep the men in spirits. I suffered them to shoot game on all occasions, and feast on it like Indian war dancers, each company by turns inviting the others to their feasts, which was the case every night, as the company that was to give the feast was always supplied with horses to lay up a sufficient store of wild meat in the course of the day, myself and principal officers putting on the woodsmen, shouting now and then, and running as much through the mud and water as any of them. Thus insensibly, without a murmur, were those men led on to the banks of the little Wabash, which we reached on the thirteenth, through incredible difficulties, far surpassing anything that any of us had ever experienced. Frequently the diversions of the night wore off the thoughts of the preceding day. We formed a camp on a height which we found on the bank of the river, and suffered our troops to amuse themselves. I viewed this sheet of water for some time with distrust, but accusing myself of doubting, I immediately set to work, without holding any consultation about it, or suffering anybody else to do so in my presence. Ordered a pirogue to be built immediately, and acted as though crossing the water would be only a piece of diversion. As but few could work at the pirogue at the time, pains were taken to find diversion for the rest, to keep them in high spirits. In the evening of the 14th, our vessel was finished, manned, and sent to explore the drowned lands on the opposite side of the little Wabash, with private instructions what report to make, and if possible to find some spot of dry land. They found about half an acre, and marked the trees from thence back to the camp, and made a very favorable report. Fortunately the fifteenth happened to be a warm, moist day for the season. The channel of the river where we lay was about thirty yards wide, a scaffold was built on the opposite shore, which was about three feet under water, and our baggage ferried across and put on it. Our horses swam across and received their loads at the scaffold, by which time the troops were also brought across, and we began our march through the water. By evening we found ourselves encamped on a pretty height, in high spirits, each party laughing at the other, in consequence of something that had happened in the course of this ferrying business, as they called it. A little antique drummer afforded them great diversion by floating on his drum, etc. All this was greatly encouraged, and they really began to think themselves superior to other men, and that neither the rivers nor the seasons could stop their progress. Their whole conversation now was concerning what they would do when they got about the enemy, they now began to view the main Wabash as a creek, and made no doubt, but such men as they were, could find a way to cross it. They wound themselves up to such a pitch, that they soon took post-wind senses, divided the spoil, and before bedtime were far advanced on the route to Detroit. All this was no doubt pleasing to those of us who had more serious thoughts. We were now convinced that the whole of the low country on the Wabash was drowned, and that the enemy could easily get to us if they discovered us, and wished to risk an action. If they did not, we made no doubt of crossing the river by some means or other. Even if Captain Rogers, with our galley, did not get to his station agreeable to his appointment, we flattered ourselves that all would be well, 
and marched on in high spirits. The last day's march through the water was far superior to anything the Frenchmen had an idea of. They were backward in speaking, said that the nearest land to us was a small league called the Sugar Camp, on the bank of the river. A canoe was sent off and returned without finding that we could pass. I went in her myself and sounded the water, found it deep as to my neck. I returned with a design to have the men transported on board the canoes to the sugar camp, which I knew would spend the whole day and ensuing night, as the vessels would pass slowly through the bushes. The loss of so much time, to men half-starved, was a matter of consequence. I would have given now a great deal for a day's provision, or for one of our horses. I returned but slowly to the troops, giving myself time to think. On our arrival all ran to hear what was the report. Every eye was fixed on me. I unfortunately spoke in a serious manner to one of the officers. The whole were alarmed without knowing what I said. I viewed their confusion for about one minute, whispered to those near me to do as I did, immediately put some water in my hand, poured on powder, blackened my face, gave the war-whoop and marched into the water without saying a word. The party gazed and fell in, one after another, without saying a word, like a flock of sheep. I ordered those near me to begin a favorite song of theirs. It soon passed through the line, and the whole went on cheerfully. I now intended to have them transported across the deepest part of the water. But when about waist deep, one of the men informed me that he thought he felt a path. We examined and found it so and concluded that it kept on the highest ground which it did, and by taking pains to follow it, we got to the sugar camp without the least difficulty, where there was about half an acre of dry ground, at least not under water, where we took up our lodging. The Frenchmen that we had taken on the river appeared to be uneasy at our situation. They begged that they might be permitted to go in the two canoes to town in the night. They said that they would bring from their own houses provisions, without the possibility of any person's knowing it, that some of our men should go with them as a surety of their good conduct, that it was impossible we could march from that place till the water fell, for the plain was too deep to march. Some of the officers believed that it might be done. I would not suffer it. I never could well account for this piece of obstinacy and give satisfactory reasons to myself or anybody else why I denied a proposition, apparently so easy to execute, and of so much advantage. But something seemed to tell me that it should not be done, and it was not done. The most of the weather that we had on this march was moist and warm for the season. This was the coldest night we had. The ice in the morning was from one half to three quarters of an inch thick near the shores and in still water. The morning was the finest we had on our march. A little after sunrise I lectured the hall. What I said to them I forget, but it may easily be imagined by a person that could possess my affections for them at that time. I concluded by informing them that passing the plain that was then in full view and reaching the opposite woods would put an end to their fatigue, that in a few hours they would have a sight of their long-wished-for object, and immediately stepped into the water without waiting for any reply. A huzzah took place. As we generally marched through the water in a line, before the third entered I halted, and called to Major Bowman, ordering him to fall to the rear with twenty-five men, and put to death any man who refused to march as we wished to have no such person among us. The whole gave a cry of approbation, and on we went. This was the most trying of all the difficulties we had experienced. I generally kept fifteen or twenty of the strongest men next myself, and judged from my own feelings what must be that of others. Getting about the middle of the plain, the water about mid-deep, I found myself sensibly failing, and, as there were no trees nor bushes for the men to support themselves by, I feared that many of the most weak would be drowned. 
I ordered the canoes to make the land, discharge their loading, and play backward and forward with all diligence, and pick up the men, and to encourage the party, sent some of the strongest men forward, with orders, when they got to a certain distance, to pass the word back that the water was getting shallow, and when getting near the woods to cry out land. This stratagem had its desired effect. The men, encouraged by it, exerted themselves almost beyond their abilities, the weak holding by the stronger. The water never got shallower, but continued deepening. Getting to the woods, where the men expected land, the water was up to my shoulders, but gaining the woods was of great consequence. All the low men and the weakly hung to the trees, and floated on the old logs until they were taken off by the canoes. The strong and tall got ashore and built fires. Many would reach the shore and fall with their bodies half in the water, not being able to support themselves without it. This was a delightful dry spot of ground of about ten acres. We soon found that the fires answered no purpose, but that two strong men taking a weaker one by the arms was the only way to recover him, and being a delightful day it soon did. But fortunately, as if designed by Providence, a canoe of Indian squaws and children was coming up to town, and took through part of this plain as a nigh way. It was discovered by our canoes as they were out after the men. They gave chase and took the Indian canoe, on board of which was near half a quarter of a buffalo, some corn, tallow, kettles, etc. This was a grand prize and was invaluable. Broth was immediately made and served out to the most weakly with great care. Most of the whole got a little, but the great many gave their part to the weakly, jocosely saying something cheering to their comrades. This little refreshment and fine weather by the afternoon gave new life to the whole. Crossing a narrow deep lake in the canoes, and marching some distance, we came to a copse of timber called the Warrior's Island. We were now in full view of the fort and town, not a shrub between us, at about two miles distance. Every man now feasted his eyes and forgot that he had suffered anything, saying that all that had passed was owing to good policy and nothing but what a man could bear, and that the soldier had no right to think, etc., passing from one extreme to another, which is common in such cases. It was now we had to display our abilities. The plain between us and the town was not a perfect level. The sunken grounds were covered with water full of ducks. We observed several men out on horseback, shooting them within a half mile of us, and sent out as many of our active young Frenchmen to decoy and take one of these men prisoner, in such a manner as not to alarm the others, which they did. The information we got from this person was similar to that which we got from those we took on the river, except that of the British having that evening completed the ball of the fort, and that there were a good many Indians in town. Our situation was now truly critical, no possibility of retreating in case of defeat, and in full view of a town that had, at this time, upward of six hundred men in it, troops, inhabitants, and Indians. The crew of the galley, though not fifty men, would have been now a reinforcement of immense magnitude to our little army, if I may so call it. But we would not think of them. We were now in the situation that I had labored to get ourselves in. The idea of being made prisoner was foreign to almost every man, as they expected nothing but torture from the savages if they fell into their hands. Our fate was now to be determined, probably in a few hours. We knew that nothing but the most daring conduct would ensure success. I knew that a number of the inhabitants wished us well, that many were lukewarm to the interest of either, and I also learned that the Grand Chief, the Tobacco's son, had but a few days before openly declared, in council with the British, that he was a brother and friend to the Big Knives. These were favorable circumstances and, as there was but little probability of our remaining until dark undiscovered, I determined to begin the career immediately, 
and brought the following placard to the inhabitants. To the inhabitants of Fort Vincennes, Gentlemen, be now within two miles of your village with my army, determined to take your fort this night, and not being willing to surprise you, I take this method to request such of you as are true citizens and willing to enjoy the liberty I bring you, to remain still in your houses, and those, if any there be, that are friends to the king, will instantly repair to the fort and join the hair by your general. Footnote. Hamilton offered rewards for American scalps, and footnote, and fight like men. And if any such as do not go to the fort shall be discovered afterward, they may depend on severe punishment. On the contrary, those who are true friends to liberty may depend on being well treated, and I once more request them to keep out of the streets. For every one I find in arms on my arrival, I shall treat him as an enemy. Signed, G. R. Clark. I had various ideas on the supposed result of this letter. I knew that it would do us no damage, but that it would cause the lukewarm to be decided, encourage our friends, and astonish our enemies. We anxiously viewed this messenger until he entered the town, and in a few minutes could discover by our glasses some stir in every street that we could penetrate into, and great numbers running or riding out into the commons we supposed to view us, which was the case. But what surprised us was that nothing had yet happened that had the appearance of the garrison being alarmed, no drum nor gun. We began to suppose that the information we got from our prisoners was false, and that the enemy already knew of us and were prepared. A little before sunset we moved, and displayed ourselves in full view of the town, crowds gazing at us. We were plunging ourselves into certain destruction, or success. There was no midway thought of. We had but little to say to our men, except inculcating an idea of the necessity of obedience, etc. We knew they did not want encouraging, and that anything might be attempted with them that was possible for such a number. Perfectly cool, under proper subordination, pleased with the prospect before them, and much attached to their officers. They all declared that they were convinced that an implicit obedience to orders was the only thing that would ensure success, and hoped that no mercy would be shown the person that should violate them. Such language as this from soldiers to persons in our station must have been exceedingly agreeable. We moved on slowly in full view of the town, but as it was a point of some consequence to us to make ourselves appear as formidable, we in leaving the covert that we were in, marched and countermarched in such a manner that we appeared numerous. In raising volunteers in the Illinois, every person that set about the business had a set of colors given him, which they brought with them to the amount of ten or twelve pairs. These were displayed to the best advantage, and, as the low plain we marched through was not a perfect level but had frequent risings in it, seven or eight feet higher than the common level, which was covered with water. And as these risings generally ran in an oblique direction to the town, we took the advantage of one of them, marching through the water under it, which completely prevented our being numbered. But our colors showed considerably above the heights, as they were fixed on long poles procured for the purpose, and at a distance made no despicable appearance. And as our young Frenchmen had, while we lay on the warrior's island, decoyed and taken several fowlers with their horses, officers were mounted on these horses, and rode about, more completely to deceive the enemy. In this manner we moved, and directed our march in such a way as to suffer it to be dark before we had advanced more than halfway to the town. We then suddenly altered our direction, and crossed ponds where they could not have suspected us, and about eight o'clock gained the heights back of the town. As there was yet no hostile appearance, we were impatient to have the cause unriddled. Lieutenant Bailey was ordered, with fourteen men, to march and fire on the fort. The main body moved in a different direction, and took possession of the strongest part of the town. 
The attack upon the town continued for some thirty-six hours. Then the audacious young leader sent a demand for surrender. It was promptly refused. Nevertheless, the surrender took place before the close of the day. End of section 92「Section 93 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 12, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 93. How the Women Brought Water to Bryan Station, 1782 by cyrus townsend brady there had been terrible doings on the frontier during the spring and summer of seventeen eighty two the british and indians had made raid after raid through the land two years before a certain colonel william bird of westover virginia a tory who seems to have been a gentleman and a soldier led some eight hundred indians with a detachment of soldiers and some artillery into kentucky none of the forts was proof against artillery nor was there any in the territory except that in the possession of george rogers clark which was not available two stations martins and ruddles were attacked in succession and easily captured their garrisons and inhabitants were murdered and tortured with shocking barbarity it is to the eternal credit of colonel bird that finding himself unable to control the indians he abandoned his expedition and withdrew otherwise the whole land would have been desolated the bulk of the invading indians were wyandots who were easily first among the savages of the northwest for ferocious valor and military skill the opposing forces being exactly equal a detachment of them defeated a certain captain estill by a series of brilliant military manoeuvres which would have done credit to a great captain being indeed upon a small scale napoleonic in their conception and execution two years after bird had withdrawn william campbell and alexander mckee notorious renegades with the infamous simon gurdy whose name has been a hissing and a byword ever since he lived led a formidable war party consisting of a few canadians and four hundred indians into kentucky the first place they attacked was bryan station another place called hoy's station was menaced by a different party of indians and express messengers had ridden to bryan station to seek aid which the settlers were ready to grant the american party was being made up to go to hoy's station early in the morning of the sixteenth of august seventeen eighty two when as they approached the gate to ride out of it a party of indians was discovered on the edge of the woods in full view the party was small in number comparatively speaking yet its members exposed themselves out of rifle range of course with such careless indifference to consequences or to a possible attack as inevitably to suggest to the mind of captain john craig who commanded the fort at the time that they were desirous of attracting the attention of the garrison in the hope that their small numbers might induce the men of the station to leave the fort and pursue them craig was an old indian fighter who had been trained in daniel boone's own school he was suspicious of any manoeuvre of that kind checking the departure of the relief party he called his brother and the principal men of the station into a council and they concluded at once that the demonstration in the front of the fort was a mere feint that the indians were anxious to be pursued and that the main attack would come from the other direction the surmise was correct with cunning adroitness campbell had massed the main body of his forces in the woods back of the fort with strict instructions for them to remain concealed and not show themselves on any account until they heard the fire coming from the front of the station which would convince them that their ruse had succeeded then they were to break from cover and rush for the back wall of the fort which they supposed would be undefended scale it and have the little garrison at their mercy it so happened that the spring from which the fort got its water supply lay within a short distance of the main body concealed in the thick woods which surrounded the clearing with the fort in the centre the situation was perfectly plain to craig and his men they determined to meet ruse with ruse and if possible to defeat the indians at their own game before they could do anything however they must have a supply of water on that hot august day life in that stockade especially when engaged in furious battle would become unsupportable without water only the ordinary amount sufficient for the night had been brought in the day before the receptacles were now empty after swift deliberations the commandant turned to the women and children crowded around the officers and explained the situation plainly to them 
he proposed that the women and children who were large enough to carry water should go down to the spring with every vessel they could carry and bring back the water upon which their lives depended he also explained to them that the spring was probably covered by concealed masses of the enemy who were waiting for the success of the demonstration in front of the fort to begin the attack he said further that it was the opinion of those in command that if the women would go to the spring as they did under ordinary circumstances as was their custom every morning that is the indians would not molest them not being desirous of breaking up the plan by which they hoped to take the fort and have everything at their mercy the men in the fort would cover the women with their rifles so far as they could it would be impossible for them to go and get water as it was not the habit of the men to do that the unusual proceeding would awaken the suspicions of the indians and the men would be shot down in the fort and all its inmates would be at the mercy of the savages every woman there was able to see the situation the theory upon which they were proceeding might be all wrong the indians might be satisfied with the certainty of capturing the women thus presented and the women and children might be taken away under the very eyes of the helpless men on the other hand it was probable though by no means certain that craig's reasoning was correct and that the indians would not discover themselves and the women and children would be allowed to return unmolested still nobody could tell what the indians would do and the situation was a terrible one capture at the very best meant death by torture the women in the fort had not lived on the frontier in vain they realized the dilemma instantly a shudder of terror and apprehension went through the crowd what would they do they must have the water the men could not get it the women did mrs jemima suggett johnson the wife of an intrepid pioneer and the daughter and sister of others instantly volunteered for the task she was the mother of five little children and her husband happened to be away in virginia at the time leaving her two little boys and her daughter sally to look after the baby in his dugout cradle she offered to go for the water this baby was that richard mentor johnson who afterward became so celebrated at the battle of the thames where tecumseh was killed and who was subsequently vice-president of the united states taking her little daughter betsy aged ten her eldest child by the hand the fearless woman headed a little band of twelve women and sixteen children who had agreed to follow where she led among them were the wives and children of the craig brothers the little ones carried wooden piggins and the women noggins and buckets the piggin was a small bucket with one upright stay for a handle a large wooden dipper as it were while the larger noggin had two upright staves for handles carefully avoiding any suspicious demonstration of force on the part of his men captain craig opened the gate and the women marched out chatting and laughing in spite of the fact that they were nearly perishing from apprehension and terror they tramped down the hill to the spring near the creek some sixty yards away with as much coolness and indifference as they could muster it was indeed a fearful moment for the women and no wonder that some of the younger ones and the older children found it difficult to control their agitation but the composed manner of those valiant and heroic matrons like mrs johnson somewhat reassured the others and completely deluded the indians probably the younger children did not realize their frightful danger and their unconsciousness helped to deceive the foes in ambush it took some time to fill the various receptacles from the small spring but by the direction of mrs johnson no one left the vicinity until all were ready to return this little party then marched deliberately back to the fort as they had come not a shot was fired the indians concealed within a stone's throw in the underbrush had looked at them with covetous eyes but such was the unwonted discipline in which they were held that they refrained from betraying themselves in the hope of afterward carrying out their stratagem as they neared the gate some of the younger ones broke into a run crowding into the door of the stockade which never looked so hospitable as on that sunny summer morning and some of the precious water was spilled but most of it was carried safe into the enclosure with what feelings of relief the fifty-odd men in the station saw their wives and children come back again can scarcely be imagined dispatching two daring men on horseback to break through the besiegers and rouse the country craig immediately laid a trap for the indians selecting a small body he sent them out to the front of the fort to engage the indians there instructing them to make as much noise and confusion as possible then he posted the main body of his men at the loopholes back of the fort instructing them not to make a move nor fire a gun until he gave the order the ruse was completely successful deceived by the hullabaloo in front the indians in the rear imagining that their plan had succeeded broke from cover and instantly dashed up to the stockade shouting their war cries and expecting an easy victory what was their surprise to find it suddenly bristling with rifles as craig and his men poured a steady withering fire into the mass crowded before them fairly decimating them they ran back instantly and concealment being at an end returned the fire ineffectually immediately thereafter from every side a furious fire from four hundred rifles burst upon the defenders all day long the siege was maintained once in a while a bullet ploughing through a crevice in the stockade struck down one of the brave garrison but the casualties in the station were very few 
on the other hand when an indian exposed himself he was sure to be killed by a shot from some unerring rifle one or two indians climbed a tree seeking to command the fort therefrom but they were quickly detected and shot before they had time to descend at last they attempted to burn the fort by shooting flaming arrows up in the air to fall perpendicularly upon the buildings the children the little boys that is and some of the older girls were lifted up on the inclined roofs where they were safe from direct rifle fire though in imminent danger of being pierced by the dropping arrows with instructions to put out the fires as fast as the arrows kindled them which they succeeded in doing meanwhile the women were busy moulding bullets and loading rifles for the men and many of them took their places on the walls and aided in the defence the mothers of our forest land their bosoms pillowed men and proud were they by such to stand in hammock fort or glen to load the sure old rifle to run the leaden ball to watch a battling husband's place and fill it should he fall finding their efforts unavailing the indians ravaged the surrounding country they killed all the cattle belonging to the pioneers burned and destroyed the fields of grain and turned the environment into a bloody desert in the afternoon a succoring party from boone's station appeared but without boone for he was absent at the time and succeeded in entering the fort End of section ninety three this recording is in the public domain section ninety four of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume twelve the united states edited by eva march tappan section ninety four the first salute to the flag seventeen seventy eight by sarah orne jewett in midwinter something happened that lifted every true heart on board there had been dull and dreary weeks on board the ranger with plots for desertion among the crew and a general look of surliness and reproach on all faces the captain was eagerly impatient in sending his messengers to nantes when the paris post might be expected and was ever disappointed at their return the discipline of the ship became more strict than before now that there was little else to command or insist upon the officers grew tired of one another's company and kept to their own quarters or passed each other without speaking it was easy indeed to be displeased with such a situation and to fret at such an apparently needless loss of time even if there were nothing else to fret about at last there was some comfort in leaving nantes and making even so short a voyage as to the neighbouring port of l'orient where the ranger was overhauled and refitted for sea yet even here the men grumbled at their temporary discomforts and above all regretted nantes where they could amuse themselves better ashore it was a hard stormy winter but there were plenty of rich english ships almost within hand's reach nobody could well understand why they had done nothing while such easy prey came and went in those waters from bordeaux and the coast of spain even from nantes itself on a certain friday orders were given to set sail and the ranger made her way along the coast to quiberon and anchored there at sunset before the bay's entrance facing the great curve of the shores she had much shipping for company farther in there lay a fine show of french frigates with a convoy and four ships of the line the captain scanned these through his glass and welcomed a great opportunity he had come upon a division of the french navy and one of the frigates flew the flag of a rear admiral la motte piquet the wind had not fallen at sundown all night the ranger tossed about and tugged at her anchor chains as if she were impatient to continue her adventures like the men between her sides all the next day she rode uneasily and clapped her sailcloth and thrummed her rigging in the squally winter blast until the sea grew quieter towards sundown then captain paul jones sent a boat to the king's fleet to carry a letter the boat was long gone the distance was little but difficult in such a sea yet some of the boats of the country came out in hope of trading with the ranger's men the poor peasants would venture anything and a strange-looking swarthy little man who got aboard nobody knew how suddenly approached the captain where he stood ablaze with impatience 
on the quarter at his first word paul jones burst with startling readiness into spanish invective and then with a look of pity at the man's poverty of dress in that icy weather took a bit of gold from his pocket barcelona said he i have had good days in barcelona myself and bade the spaniard be gone then he called him back and asked a few questions and summoning a quartermaster gave orders that he should take the sailor's poor gear and give him a warm coat and cap from the slop chests he has lost his ship and got stranded here said the captain with compassion and then turned again to watch for the boat you may roll the coat and cap into a bundle they are quaint fashioned things he added carelessly as the quartermaster went away the bay was now alive with small breton traders and at a short distance away there was a droll little potato fleet making hopefully for the ranger the headmost boat however was the ranger's own with an answer to the captain's letter he gave an anxious sigh and laid down his glass he had sent to say frankly to the rear admiral that he flew the new american flag and that no foreign power had yet saluted it and to ask if his own salute to the royal navy of france would be properly returned it was already in the last fluster of the february wind and the sea was going down there was no time to be lost he broke the great seal of his answer with a trembling hand and at the first glance pressed the letter to his breast the french frigates were a little apart from their convoy and rolled sullenly in a solemn company their tall masts swaying like timekeepers against the pale winter sky the low land lay behind them its line broken here and there by strange mounds and by ancient altars of the druids like clumsy heavy-legged beasts standing against the winter sunset the captain gave orders to hoist the anchor nobody knew why and to spread the sails when it was no time to put to sea he stood like a king until all was done and then passed the word for his gunners to be ready and steered straight in toward the french fleet they all understood now the little ranger ran slowly between the frowning ships looking as warlike as they her men swarmed like bees into the rigging her colours ran up to salute the flag of his most christian majesty of france and she fired one by one her salute of thirteen guns there was a moment of suspense the wind was very light now the powder smoke drifted away and the flapping sails sounded loud overhead would the admiral answer or would he treat this bold challenge like a handkerchief waved at him from a pleasure boat some of the officers on the ranger looked incredulous but paul jones still held his letter in his hand there was a puff of white smoke and the great guns of the french flagship began to shake the air one two three four five six seven eight nine and then were still save for their echoes from the low hills about karnak and the great druid mount of st michael gardner you may tell the men that this was the salute of the king of france to our republic and the first high honour to our colours said the captain proudly to his steersmen but they were all huzzaing now along the ranger's decks that little ship whose name shall never be forgotten while her country lives we hardly know what this day means gentlemen he said soberly to his officers who came about him i believe that we are at the christening of the greatest nation that was ever born into the world he lifted his hat and stood looking up at the flag End of section ninety four chapter ninety five of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume twelve the united states edited by eva march tappan section ninety five john paul jones in the revolution seventeen seventy five to seventeen eighty one by joel tyler headley in seventeen seventy five when the american revolution broke out 
the young scotchman commenced his brilliant career his offer to congress to serve in the navy was accepted and he was appointed first lieutenant in the alfred as the commander-in-chief of the squadron came on board jones unfurled the national flag the first time its folds were ever given to the breeze what that flag was strange as it may seem no record or tradition can certainly tell it was not the stars and the stripes for they were not generally adopted till two years after the generally received opinion is that it was a pine tree with a rattlesnake coiled at the roots as if about to spring and underneath the motto don't tread on me at all events it unrolled to the breeze and waved over as gallant a young officer as ever trod a quarter-deck if the flag bore such a symbol it was most appropriate to jones for no serpent was ever more ready to strike than he fairly afloat twenty-nine years of age healthy well-knit though of light and slender frame a commissioned officer in the american navy the young gardener saw with joy the shores receding as the fleet steered for the bahama isles a skilful seaman at home on the deck and a bold and daring man he could not but distinguish himself in whatever circumstances he might be placed the result of this expedition was the capture of new providence with a hundred cannon and an abundance of military stores it came near failing through the bungling management of the commander-in-chief and would have done so but for the perseverance and daring of paul jones as the fleet was returning home he had an opportunity to try himself in battle the glasgow an english ship was chased by the whole squadron yet escaped during the running fight jones commanded the lower battery of the alfred and exhibited that coolness and daring which afterwards so characterized him soon after he was transferred to the sloop providence and ordered to put to sea on a six weeks cruise it required no ordinary skill or boldness to keep this little sloop hovering amid the enemy's cruisers and yet avoid capture indeed his short career seemed about to end for he found himself one day chased by the english frigate sola bay and despite of every exertion overhauled so that at the end of four hours his vessel was brought within musket shot of the enemy whose heavy cannon kept thundering against him gallantly returning the fire with his light guns jones though there seemed no chance of escape still kept his flag flying and saved himself by his extraordinary seamanship finding himself lost in the course he was pursuing he gradually worked his little vessel off till he got the sola bay on his weather quarter when he suddenly exclaimed up helm to the steersman and setting every sail that would draw stood dead before the wind bearing straight down on the english frigate and passing within pistol shot of her before the enemy could recover his surprise at this bold an unexpected manoeuvre or bring his ship into the same position jones was showing him a clean pair of heels his little sloop could outsail the frigate before the wind and he bore proudly away he soon after had another encounter with the english frigate milford he was lying to near the isle of sable fishing when the milford hove in sight immediately putting his ship in trim he tried the relative speed of the two vessels and finding that he could outsail his antagonist let him approach the englishman kept rounding too as he advanced and pouring his broadsides on the sloop but at such a distance that not a shot told thus jones kept irritating his more powerful enemy keeping him at just such a distance as to make his firing ridiculous still it was a hazardous experiment for a single chance shot crashing through his rigging might have reduced his speed so much as to prevent his escape but to provoke the englishman still more jones as he walked quietly away ordered one of his men to return each of the enemy's broadsides with a single musket shot this insulting treatment made a perfect farce of the whole chase and must have enraged the commander of the milford beyond measure he continued cruising about and at the end of forty-seven days 
sailed into newport with sixteen prizes he next planned an expedition against cape breton to break up the fisheries and though he did not wholly succeed he returned to boston in about a month with four prizes and a hundred and fifty prisoners the clothing on its way to the canada troops which he captured came very opportunely for the destitute soldiers of the american army during this expedition jones had command of the alfred but was superseded on his return and put on board his old sloop the providence this was the commencement of a series of unjust acts on the part of our government towards him which as yet could not break away from english example and make brave deeds the only road to rank it insisted according to the old continental rule with which bonaparte made such wild work on giving the places of trust to the sons of distinguished gentlemen jones remonstrated against this injustice and pressed the government so closely with his importunities and complaints that to get rid of him it sent him to boston to select and fit out a ship for himself in the meantime he recommended measures to the government respecting the organizing and strengthening of the navy which show him to have been the most enlightened naval officer in our service and that his sound and comprehensive views were equal to his bravery most of his suggestions were adopted and the foundation of the american navy laid soon after june seventeen seventy seven he was given command of the ranger and informed in his commission that the flag of the united states was to be thirteen stripes and the union thirteen stars on a blue field representing a new constellation in the heavens with joy he hoisted this new flag and put to sea in his badly equipped vessel steering for france where he was by order of his government to take charge of a large vessel there to be purchased for him by the american commissioners failing in this enterprise he again set sail in the ranger and steered for quiberon bay here passing through the french fleet with his brig he obtained a national salute the first ever given our colours having had the honour first to hoist our flag on the water and the first to hear the guns of a powerful nation thunder forth their recognition of it he again put to sea and boldly entered the irish channel capturing several prizes steering for the isle of man he planned an expedition which illustrates the boldness and daring that characterized him he determined to burn the shipping in whitehaven in retaliation for the injuries inflicted on our coast by english ships more than three hundred vessels lay in this port protected by two batteries composed of thirty pieces of artillery while eighty rods distant was a strong fort to enter a port so protected and filled with shipping with a single brig and apply the torch under the very muzzles of the cannon was an act unrivalled in daring but jones seemed to delight in these reckless deeds there appeared to be a sort of witchery about danger to him and the greater it was the more enticing it became once when government was making arrangements to furnish him with a ship he urged the necessity of giving him a good one for said he i intend to go in harm's way this was true and he generally managed to carry out his intentions it was about midnight on the twenty second of april seventeen seventy eight when jones stood boldly in to the port of whitehaven having got sufficiently near he took two boats and thirty-one men and rowed noiselessly away from his gallant little ship he commanded one boat in person and took upon himself the task of securing the batteries with a mere handful of men he scaled the breastwork seized the sentinel on duty before he could give the alarm and rushing forward took the astonished soldiers prisoners and spiked the cannon then leaving lieutenant wallingsford to fire the shipping he hastened forward with only one man to take the fort all was silent as he approached and boldly entering he spiked every cannon and then hurried back to his little band he was surprised as he approached not to see the shipping in a blaze and demanded of his lieutenant why he had not fulfilled his orders the latter replied that his light had gone out but he evidently did not like his mission and purposely neglected to obey orders everything had been managed badly 
and to his mortification he saw the day beginning to dawn and his whole plan at the moment when it promised complete success overturned the people rousing from their slumbers saw with alarm a band of men with half-burnt candles in their hands standing on the pier and assembled in crowds jones however refused to depart and indignant at the failure of the expedition entered alone a large ship and coolly sat down and kindled a fire in the steerage he then hunted about for a barrel of tar which having found he poured it over the flames the blaze shot up around the lofty spars and wreathed the rigging in their spiral folds casting a baleful light over the town the terrified inhabitants seeing the flames shoot heavenward rushed toward the wharves but jones posted himself by the entrance to the ship with a cocked pistol in his hand threatening to shoot the first who should approach they hesitated a moment and then turned and fled gazing a moment on the burning ship and the panic-struck multitude he entered his boat and leisurely rowed back to the ranger that sat like a seagull on the water the bright sun had now risen and was bathing the land and sea in its light revealing to the inhabitants the little craft that had so boldly entered their waters and they hastened to their fort to open their cannon upon it to their astonishment they found them spiked they however got possession of two guns which they began to fire but the shot fell so wide of the mark that the sailors in contempt fired back their pistols the expedition had failed through the inefficiency of his men and especially one deserter who remained behind to be called the saviour of whitehaven but it showed to england that her own coast was not safe from the hands of the spoiler and that the torch she carried into our ports might be hurled into hers also in carrying it out jones exhibited a daring and coolness never surpassed by any man the only drawback to it was that it occurred in the neighbourhood of his birthplace and amid the hallowed associations of his childhood one would think that the familiar hill-tops and mountain ranges and the thronging memories they would bring back on the bold rover would have sent him to other portions of the coast to inflict distress it speaks badly for the man's sensibilities though so well for his courage he next entered kirk cudbright bay in a single boat for the purpose of taking lord selkirk prisoner the absence of the nobleman alone prevented his success the next day as he was off carrick fergus he saw the drake an english ship of war working slowly out of harbour to go in pursuit of his vessel that was sending such consternation along the scottish coast five small vessels filled with citizens accompanied her part of the way a heavy tide was setting landward and the vessel made feeble headway but at length she made her last tack and stretched boldly out into the channel the ranger when she first saw the drake coming out of the harbour ran down to meet her and then lay to till the latter had cleared the port she then filled away and stood out into the centre of the channel the drake had in volunteers and all a crew of a hundred and sixty men besides carrying two guns more than the ranger she also belonged to the regular british navy while jones had a crew imperfectly organized and but partially used to the discipline of a vessel of war he however saw with delight his formidable enemy approach and when the latter hailed him asking what ship it was he replied the american continental ship ranger we are waiting for you come on alarm fires were burning along both shores and the hilltops were covered with spectators witnessing the meeting of these two ships the sun was only an hour high and as the blazing fireball stooped to the western wave jones commenced the attack steering directly across the enemy's bow he poured in a deadly broadside which was promptly returned the two ships moved gallantly away side by side while broadside after broadside thundered over the deep within close musket shot they continued to sweep slowly and sternly onward for an hour wreathed in smoke while the incessant crash of timbers on board the drake told how terrible was the american's fire first her fore and main topsails were carried away then the yards began to tumble one after another until at length her ensign fallen also draggled in the water jones kept pouring in his destructive broadsides which the drake answered but with less effect while the topmen of the ranger made fearful havoc amid the dense crew of the enemy as the last sunlight was leaving its farewell on the distant mountain tops the commander of the drake fell 
shot through the head with a musket ball and the british flag was lowered to the stripes and stars a ceremony which in after years became quite common jones returned with his prizes to paris and offered his services to france in hopes of getting command of a larger vessel he gave up the ranger but soon had cause to regret it for he was left for a long time without employment he had been promised the indian and the prince of nassau pleased by the daring of jones had promised to accompany him as a volunteer but this fell through together with many other projects but for the firm friendship of franklin he would have fared but poorly in the french capital after a long series of annoyances and disappointments he at length obtained command of a vessel which out of respect to franklin he named the bon homme richard the poor richard with seven ships in all a snug little squadron for jones had the different commanders been subordinate he set sail from france and steered for the coast of ireland the want of proper subordination was soon made manifest for in a week's time the vessels one after another parted company to cruise by themselves till jones had with him but the alliance palace and vengeance in a tremendous storm he bore away and after several days of gales and heavy seas approached the shore of scotland taking several prizes near the firth of forth he is ascertained that a twenty-four gun ship and two cutters were in the roads these he determined to cut out and landing at leith lay the town under contribution the inhabitants supposed his little fleet to be english vessels in pursuit of paul jones and a member of parliament a wealthy man in the place sent off a boat requesting powder and balls to defend himself as he said against the pirate paul jones jones very politely sent back the bearer with a barrel of powder expressing his regrets that he had no shot to spare soon after in his pompous inflated manner he summoned the town to surrender but the wind blowing steadily off the land he could not approach with his vessel at length however the wind changed and the richard stood boldly in for the shore the inhabitants as they saw her bearing steadily up towards the place were filled with terror and ran hither and thither in affright but the good minister rev mr Chirac, assembled his flock on the beach to pray the lord to deliver them from their enemies he was an eccentric man one of the quaintest of the quaint scotch divines so that his prayers even in those days were often quoted for their oddity and even roughness whether the following prayer is literally true or not it is difficult to tell but there is little doubt that the invocation of the excited eccentric old man was sufficiently odd it is said that having gathered his congregation on the beach in full sight of the vessel which under a press of canvas was making a long tack that brought her close to the town he knelt down on the sand and thus began now dear lord dinna ye think it a shame for ye to send this vile pirate to rob our folk a kirkaldy for ye ken they're pure enow already and hey naething to spare the way the wind blaws he'll be here in a jiffy and wa kens what he may do he's nae too good for ony thing mickles the mischief he has done already he'll burn their houses tack their very clays and turl them to the sark and ways me wa kens but the bloody villain might take their lives the poor weemen are maist frightened out of their wits and the bairns skirling after them i canna think of it i canna think of it i hae been long a faithful servant to ye lord but gin ye dinna turn the wind about and blaw the scandal out of our gate i'll nae stir a foot but we'll just sit here till the tide comes say take yer will aught to the no little astonishment of the good people a fierce gale at that moment began to blow which sent one of jones's prizes ashore and forced him to stand out to sea this fixed forever the reputation of good mr Chirac and he did not himself wholly deny that he believed his intercessions brought on the gale for whenever his parishioner spoke of it to him he always replied i prayed but the lord sent the wind stretching from thence along the english coast jones cruised about for a while and at length fell in with the alliance which had parted company with him a short time previous with this vessel the palace and vengeance making with the richard four ships he stood to the north when on the afternoon of september the twenty third seventeen seventy nine he saw a fleet of forty one sail hugging the coast this was the baltic fleet under the convoy of the serapis of forty-one guns and the countess of scarborough of twenty guns jones immediately issued his orders to form 
line of battle while with his ship he gave chase the convoy scattered like wild pigeons and ran for the shore to place themselves under the protection of a fort but the two warships advanced to the conflict it was a beautiful day the wind was light so that not a wave broke the smooth surface of the sea and all was smiling and tranquil on land as the hostile forces slowly approached each other the piers of scarborough were crowded with spectators and the old promontory of flamborough over three miles distant was black with the multitude assembled to witness the engagement the breeze was so light that the vessels approached each other slowly as if reluctant to come to the mortal struggle and mar that placid scene and that beautiful evening with the sound of battle it was a thrilling spectacle those bold ships with their sails all set moving sternly up to each other at length the cloudless sun sank behind the hills and twilight deepened over the waters the next moment the full round moon pushed its broad disk over the tranquil waters bathing in her soft beams the white sails that now seemed like gentle moving clouds on the deep the palace stood for the countess of scarborough while the alliance after having also come within range withdrew and took up a position where she could safely contemplate the fight paul jones now in his element paced the deck to and fro impatient for the contest and at length approached within pistol shot of the serapis the latter was a new ship with an excellent crew and throwing with every broadside seventy-five pounds more than the richard jones however rated this lightly and with his old half-worn-out merchantman closed fearlessly with his powerful antagonist as he approached the latter captain pearson hailed him with what ship is that i can't hear what you say was the reply what ship is that rang back answer immediately or i shall fire into you a shot from the richard was the significant answer and immediately both vessels opened their broadsides two of the three old eighteen-pounders of the richard burst at the first fire and jones was compelled to close the lower deck ports which were not opened again during the action this was an ominous beginning for it reduced the force of the richard to one-third below that of the serapis the broadsides now became more rapid presenting a strange spectacle to the people on shore the flashes of the guns amid the cloud of smoke followed by the roar that shook the coast the dim moonlight serving to but half reveal the struggling vessels conspired to render it one of terror and of dread the two vessels kept moving alongside constantly crossing each other's track now passing each other's bow and now the stern pouring in such terrific broadsides as made both friend and foe stagger thus fighting and manoeuvring they swept onward until at length the richard got foul of the serapis and jones gave the orders to board his men were repulsed and captain pearson hailed him to know if he had struck i have not yet begun to fight was the short and stern reply of jones and backing his topsails while the serapis kept full the vessels parted and again came alongside and broadside answered broadside with fearful effect but jones soon saw that this mode of fighting would not answer the superiority in weight of metal gave them great advantage in this heavy cannonading especially as his vessel was old and rotten while every timber in that of his antagonist was new and stanch and so he determined to throw himself aboard of the enemy in doing this he fell farther than he intended and his vessel catching a moment by the jib boom of the serapis carried it away and the two ships swung close alongside of each other head and stern the muzzles of the guns touching jones immediately ordered them to be lashed together and in his eagerness to secure them helped with his own hands to tie the lashings captain pearson did not like this close fighting for it destroyed all the advantage his superior sailing and heavier guns gave him and so let drop an anchor to swing his ship apart but the two vessels were firmly clenched in the embrace of death for added to all the lashings a spare anchor of the serapis had hooked the quarter of the richard so that when the former obeyed her cable and swung round to the tide the latter swung also finding that he could not unlock the desperate embrace in which his foe had clasped him the englishman again opened his broadsides the action then became terrific the guns touched muzzles and the gunners in ramming home their cartridges were compelled frequently to thrust their ramrods into the enemy's ports never before had an english commander met such a foeman nor fought such a battle the timbers rent at every explosion and huge gaps opened in the sides of each vessel while they trembled at each discharge as if in the mouth of a volcano with his heaviest guns burst and part of his deck blown up jones still kept up this unequal fight with a bravery unparalleled in naval warfare 
he with his own hands helped to work the guns and blackened with powder and smoke moved about among his men with the stern expression never to yield written on his delicate features in lines not to be mistaken to compensate for the superiority of the enemy's guns he had to discharge his own with greater rapidity so that after a short time they became so hot that they bounded like mad creatures in their fastenings and at every discharge the gallant ship trembled like a smitten ox from kelson to cross trees and heeled over till her yard-arms almost swept the water in the meantime his topmen did terrible execution hanging amid the rigging they dropped hand grenades on the enemy's decks with fatal precision one daring fellow walked out on the end of the yard with a bucket full of these missiles in his hand and hurling them below finally set fire to a heap of cartridges the blaze and explosion which followed were terrific arms and legs went heavenward together and nearly sixty men were killed or wounded by this sudden blow they succeeded at length in driving most of the enemy below decks the battle then presented a singular aspect jones made the upper deck of the serapis too hot for her crew while the latter tore his lower deck so dreadfully with her broadsides that his men could not remain there a moment thus they fought one above and the other beneath the blood in the meantime flowing in rills over the decks of both ten times was the serapis on fire and as often were the flames extinguished never did a man struggle braver than the english commander but a still braver heart opposed him at this juncture the alliance came up and instead of pouring her broadsides into the serapis hurled them against the poor richard now poor indeed jones was in a transport of rage but he could not help himself in this awful crisis fighting by the light of the guns for the smoke had shut out that of the moon the gunner and carpenter both rushed up declaring the ship was sinking the shot holes which had pierced the hull of the richard between wind and water had already sunk below the surface and the water was pouring in like a torrent the carpenter ran to pull down the colours which were still flying amid the smoke of battle while the gunner cried quarter for god's sake quarter still keeping up this cry jones hurled a pistol which he had just fired at the enemy at his head which fractured his skull and sent him headlong down the hatchway captain pearson hailed to know if he had struck and was answered by jones with a no accompanied by an oath that told that if he could do no better he would go down with his colours flying the master-at-arms hearing the gunner's cry and thinking the ship was going to the bottom released a hundred english prisoners into the midst of the confusion one of these passing through the fire to his own ship told captain pearson that the richard was sinking and if he would hold out a few moments longer she must go down imagine the condition of jones at this moment with every battery silenced except the one at which he still stood unshaken his ship gradually settling beneath him a hundred prisoners swarming his deck and his own consort raking him with her broadsides his last hope seemed about to expire still he would not yield his officers urged him to surrender while cries of quarter arose on every side undismayed and resolute to the last he ordered the prisoners to the pumps declaring if they refused to work he would take them to the bottom with him thus making panic fight panic he continued the conflict the spectacle at this moment was awful both vessels looked like wrecks and both were on fire the flames shot heavenward around the mast of the serapis and at length at half-past ten she struck for a time the inferior officers did not know which had yielded such a perfect tumult had the fight become for three hours and a half had this incessant cannonade within yard-arm and yard-arm of each other continued piling three hundred dead and wounded men on those shattered decks nothing but the courage and stern resolution of jones never to surrender saved him from defeat when the morning dawned the bon homme richard presented a most deplorable appearance she lay a complete wreck on the sea riddled through and literally stove to pieces there were six feet of water in the hold while above she was on fire in two places jones had put forth every effort to save the vessel in which he had won such renown but in vain he kept her afloat all the following day and night but next morning she was found to be going the waves rolled through her she swayed from side to side like a dying man then gave a lurch forward and went down head foremost jones stood on the deck of the english ship and watched her as he would a dying friend and finally with a swelling heart saw her last mast disappear and the eddying waves close with a rushing sound over her as she sank with the dead who had so nobly fallen on her decks they could have wished no better coffin or burial captain pearson was made a knight for the bravery with which he had defended his ship 
when it was told to jones he wittily remarked that if he ever caught him at sea again he would make a lord of him landais of the alliance who had evidently designed to destroy jones then take the english vessel and claim the honour of the victory was disgraced for his conduct franklin could not conceal his joy at the result of the action and received the heroic jones with transport the remainder of this year was one of annoyance to jones landais continued to give him trouble and the french government constantly put him off in his request to be furnished with a ship but at length the alliance which had borne such a disgraceful part in the engagement with the serapis was placed under his command and he determined to return to america but he lay wind-bound for some time in the texel while an english squadron guarded the entrance of the port during this delay he was subject to constant annoyances from the dutch admiral of the port the latter inquired whether his vessel was french or american and demanded if it was french that he should hoist the national colours and if american that he should leave immediately jones would bear no flag but that of his adopted country and promised to depart notwithstanding the presence of the english squadron watching for him the moment the wind would permit at length losing all patience with the conduct of the dutch admiral he coolly sent word to him that although he commanded a sixty-four if the two vessels were out to sea his insolence would not be tolerated a moment the wind finally shifting he hoisted sail and with the stripes floating in the breeze stood fearlessly out of the harbour with his usual good luck he escaped the vigilance of the english squadron cleared the channel and with all his sails set and under a staggering breeze stretched away toward the spanish coast nothing of consequence occurred during this cruise and the next year we find him again in paris and in hot water respecting the infamous landais whom arthur lee one of the american commissioners at paris presumed to favour at length however he was appointed to the ariel and ordered to leave for america with military stores in the meantime however the french king had presented him with a magnificent sword and bestowed on him the cross of military merit on the seventh of september he finally put to sea but had hardly left the coast when the wind changed and began to blow a hurricane jones attempted to stretch northward and clear the land but in vain he found himself close on a reef of rocks and unable to carry a rag of canvas so fierce was the wind that although blowing simply on the naked spars and deck it buried the ship waist deep in the sea and she rolled so heavily that her yards would frequently be under water added to all the horrors of his position she began to leak badly while the pumps would not work jones heaved the lead with his own hand and found that he was rapidly shoaling water there seemed now no way of escape yet as a last feeble hope he let go an anchor but so fierce and wild were the wind and sea that it did not even bring the ship's head to and she kept driving broadside toward the rocks cable after cable was spliced on yet still she surged heavily landward he then cut away the foremast when the anchor probably catching in a rock brought the ship round that good anchor held like the hand of fate and though the vessel jerked at every blow of the billows as if she would wrench everything apart yet still she lay chained amid the chaos of waters at length the mainmast fell with a crash against the mizzenmast carrying that away also and the poor ariel swept to her decks lay a complete wreck on the waves in this position she acted like a mad creature chained by the head to a ring that no power can sunder she leaped and plunged and rolled from side to side as if striving with all her untamed energy to rend the length that bound her and madly rush on the rocks over which the foam rose like the spray from the foot of a cataract for two days and three nights did jones thus meet the full terror of the tempest at last it abated and he was unable to return to port the coast was strewed with wrecks and the escape of the ariel seemed almost a miracle but jones was one of those fortunate beings who though ever seeking the storm and the tumult are destined finally to die in their beds early the next year he reached philadelphia and received a vote of thanks from congress after vexatious delays in his attempts to get the command of a large vessel he at length joined the french fleet in its expedition to the west indies peace soon after being proclaimed he returned to france and failing in a projected expedition to the northwest coast sailed again for the united states congress voted him a gold medal and he was treated with distinction wherever he went failing again in his efforts to get command of a large vessel he returned to france years had now passed away and jones was forty years of age he had won an imperishable name and the renown of his deeds had been spread throughout the world the title of chevalier had been given him by the french king and he was at an age when it might be supposed he would repose on his laurels but russia then at war with turkey sought his services and made brilliant offers which he at last accepted and prepared to depart for st petersburg 
on reaching stockholm he found the gulf of bothnia so blocked with ice that it was impossible to cross it but impatient to be on his way he determined to sail round the ice to the southward in the open baltic hiring an open boat about thirty feet long he started on his perilous expedition knowing that the boatmen would refuse to accompany him if made acquainted with his desperate plan he kept them in ignorance until he got fairly out to sea then drew his pistol and told them to stretch away into the baltic the poor fellows placed between scylla and charybdis obeyed and the frail craft was soon tossing in the darkness escaping every danger he at length on the fourth day reached revel and set off for st petersburg amid the astonishment of the people who looked upon his escape as almost miraculous he was received with honour by the empress who immediately conferred on him the rank of rear admiral a brilliant career now seen before him nobles and foreign ambassadors thronged his residence and there appeared no end to the wonder his adventurous life had created he soon after departed for the black sea and took command of a squadron under the direction of prince potemkin the former lover of the empress and the real czar of russia jones fought gallantly under this haughty prince but at length disgusted with the annoyances to which he was subjected he came to an open quarrel and finally returned to st petersburg here he for a while fell into disgrace on account of some unjust accusations against his moral character but finally through count segur the french ambassador was restored to favour in seventeen ninety two he was taken sick at paris and gradually declined he had been making strenuous efforts in behalf of the american prisoners in algiers but never lived to see his benevolent plans carried out on the eighteenth of july seventeen ninety two he made his will and his friends after witnessing it bade him good evening and departed his physician coming soon after perceived his chair vacant and going to his bed found him stretched upon it dead a few days after a dispatch was received from the united states appointing him commissioner to treat with algiers for the ransom of the american prisoners in captivity there the national assembly of france decreed that twelve of its members should assist at the funeral ceremonies of admiral paul jones and a eulogium was pronounced over his tomb thus died paul jones at the age of forty-five leaving a name that shall live as long as the american navy rides the sea end of section ninety five this recording is in the public domain section ninety six of the united states read for librivox dot org by sonia the fight between the serapis and the bonhomme richard by walt whitman from an old engraving painting page five hundred eighty eight ten o'clock at night and the full moon shining and the leaks on the gain and five feet of water reported the master at arms losing the prisoners confined in the afterhold to give them a chance for themselves the transit to and from the magazine was now stopped by the sentinels they saw so many strange faces they did not know whom to trust our frigate was afire the other asked if we demanded quarter if our colours were struck and the fighting done i laughed content when i heard the voice of my little captain we have not struck he composedly cried we have just begun our part of the fighting only three guns were in use one was directed by the captain himself against the enemy's mainmast two well served with grape and canister silenced his musketry and cleared his decks the tops alone seconded the fire of this little battery especially the main top they all held out bravely during the whole of the action not a moment's cease the leaks gained fast on the pumps the fire eat toward the powder magazine one of the pumps was shot away it was generally thought we were sinking serene stood the little captain he was not hurried his voice was neither high nor low his eyes gave more light to us than our battle lanterns toward twelve at night there in the beams of the moon they surrendered to us walt whitman end of section ninety six end of the world story a history of the world in story song and art volume twelve the united states edited by eva march tappan